the hour of 1.40 having arrived and a, uh, a quorum having arrived, clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Council Members Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Brunner? Present. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Um, Vice Mayor Golder is currently absent. Mayor Keeley? Here. A quorum having been established, we'll move on to our next item, which is any public comment that folks may want to provide concerning our closed session that we will be going into in just a moment. Uh, that is, uh, we have one item on closed session. This is a claim against the city of Santa Cruz. If anyone wishes to provide comment on that item, this would be your opportunity to do so. Seeing and hearing no one, do we have anyone online? We do, we have one person. We'll take that person. Good afternoon, person online. Hello? Hello. Hi, I'm, should I go? Yes, please do. Okay, I'm Kathleen Gould. I'm here to speak briefly on this matter um, before you today, which is cost to repair my car after a city tree at Grant Street Park dropped a large branch and fell directly on my car. I was just informed of this Friday after close of business that the issue was being brought to you today, and I only found out yesterday morning that the claim was denied. So I haven't had much time to put together a counter argument. I've been a little hampered because I'm not getting any return emails or calls, but um, there are some extenuating circumstances that I believe will make it clear that the claim should be paid. In some cases, a tree or branch falling may be considered an act of God or a natural disaster. In fact, that's the reason I was given for the denial of the claim. However, in this case, the city should have known the tree was a danger because it dropped at least one large branch days before the incident with my car. After the first big limb dropped, the city was aware there was an issue with the tree, whether the tree is sick or experiencing sudden limb drop from the heat, which is what the risk manager claims. Either way, the city was aware of the likelihood and danger from the tree, which by the way, is right over the pump track at Grant Park and likely to harm children if another limb drops. While the first spontaneous break of the tree might be considered a natural disaster, the second, only days later, the one that landed on my car should have been foreseen and mitigated. When city staff arrived to remove the branch from my car, he called the event a widow maker. In fact, if I was seconds earlier, I probably would have been killed. In discussions with the risk manager today, he simply said this kind of tree drops branches and that's just what it is. Really? Eight inch diameter, 20 foot limbs are dropping right near the little pump track that kids are playing on and the park service response is, it's just what it is. Do you think that's reasonable? The city has a duty to exercise reasonable care in maintaining public spaces, including parks. This duty includes ensuring that trees within the city parks are healthy and pose no unrisk, duty, unrisk to the public. If they know the trees are likely to drop limbs, they should trim them. My claim was denied because he deemed the event a natural disaster. When I first spoke to him and told him that the tree had previously lost at least one limb, he said he would contact the arborist and park manager and get back to me. The simple fact that the knowledge of the previous issue would cause him to reconsider his conclusion makes it clear that a reasonable person would conclude that knowing about a problem with the tree and failing to mitigate it would be negligent. The park service knew about the problem because they cleaned up the first tree. If they failed to report it to the arborist, that would be negligent. If the arborist inspected the tree and found it to be sound, and yet it dropped the widow maker days later, that would be negligent. And if the city fails to accept responsibility for mitigating known safety hazards, that's negligent. So when this item comes before you, please overturn the recommendation and pay for the damage to my car that was caused by negligence. This was not a natural disaster. The tree gave a clear indication that there was a problem. The city failed to mitigate the danger, thus resulting in damage to my property. Again, the first limb drop could be considered an act of God. The second was foreseeable and preventable. This is why you have insurance, to cover the things that you're responsible for. Last Friday, I saw the tree, and it looked like to me like there was a third limb that was dead and ready to fall. Please act responsibly. I do have some pictures, but I'm not sure I'm even on. Um, I don't know how to show them to you that show the two branches, um, but Thank you for your attention and consideration, and please realize that this was preventable and 
not an act of God. It was something that you could have fixed after the first limb fall. And I would like to get my car fixed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Gold, for calling in and providing that input. Let me ask if anyone else with us wishes to make comment. Do we have someone else online? We'll take that person online. Good afternoon. Hi, I hope you can hear me. My name is Rachel Sotos, and I would like to again request that the city of Santa Cruz establish citizen-led truth commissions to investigate okay, every me, aspect uh, of the uh, COVID uh, era. That Mayor me, Keeling and Council me. Member... Excuse me. So, uh, I'm sorry, what we are on right now, I suspect you want to call back in under oral communications. What we're on right now is any comment on our closed session litigation item. Uh, oh, I, I'm wish, so sorry. No, no, it, it's not a problem. Uh, call back in. We'll be on oral communications probably about 150 or so. Well, that'll be in two or three minutes. Probably I, between I can wait, now please. and two o'clock, but right now we're on a separate item. But thank you so much. Anybody else? We are going to adjourn into closed session. We'll probably be back out here in 10 minutes or so. Council is back in session following our closed session. The uh, clerk will call the roll. Thank you, Mayor. Councilmember Newsom? Present. Brown? Here. Watkins? Here. Bruner? Present. Kalantari Johnson? Present. Vice Mayor Golder is absent, and Mayor Keeley? Here. The quorum having been established, we'll move on to oral communications. This will be the opportunity for anyone to address us on a matter under our jurisdiction, but not on today's agenda. Anyone who's with us today would like to do that uh, as we are, please come forward. Nice to see you again, sir. Ms. Bush, while the gentleman's approaching, do we have uh, anyone online? We do. We do. Good afternoon, sir. Yeah, good afternoon. My name is James Ewing Whitman. I have a public service announcement for the whole community. And I'm going to give all of you copies of your city government about city managers and the citizens rule book. On page four, it describes how a juror has more power than the president or the Supreme Court. On page 26 is our Declaration of Independence. There's plenty of other good information there. I suggest you guys read it because other people will be talking about it. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'll bring up some other stuff. What could I say that stays on subject? Exposing the Delphi technique in public meetings. Warning. Scientifically devised propaganda, propaganda formula developed by the Travistock and Rand, used by intelligence agencies and their assets as a social act, such as social action groups from globalist foundations, schools, churches, seminars, in order to trick and control your mind and thought outcome. It, it's just kind of a process of what I'm witnessing with a great deal of the conversations. So all I can say is it's been quite the learning curve. I'll bring up some other stuff later, and I'll stay on subject. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one person online. Currently two. Two. We'll take the first one. Good afternoon, person online. Hi, thank you. Um, I apologize for before. My name is There's Rachel no Sotos, and I'd again no need, like no to suggest to that the city um, establish truth commissions for the COVID era. The Mayor Keeling and Councilmember Kalantari Johnson are joining the County Housing for Health Partnership, underscores the importance, I think, of such citizen led um, uh, commissions. I ask that both Mayor Keeling and Councilmember Kalantari Johnson and their staffs give attention to the dangers of corrupted regulatory agencies and um, the threat of an encroaching biosecurity surveillance regime. It's for good reason that the U.S. Congress has just voted to defund the World Health Organization. 
Remember when the top two for vaccine policy at the FDA resigned? Well, on top of so many other revelations, we now know, thanks to FOIA requests, that in 2021, the Biden administration lied about the dangers of myocarditis. Given that only 2% of the population is getting boosted, I think we all know that something is wrong. And yet with few exceptions, as in Florida, public health officials are continuing to deliver vulnerable bodies, the bodies of the homeless, of children and pregnant women, to the pharmaceutical industry. Because there's so much at stake, I think it is time to leverage the wisdom of the community with citizen-led truth commissions, lest we fail to recognize the errors of the past and, heaven forbid, commit worse ones in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Second person online, good afternoon. Three, two. Yes, hello. This is good. There we hey, go. Um, uh, I don't mind that a lot of you look like you're not paying attention to oral communications. You usually don't, so I'm not surprised by that. Anyway, when evaluating possible council actions, I believe in today's world it is critical to analyze such for any alarming similarities to the strategic point of view of revolutionaries actively pursuing the destruction of this country. For them, there are subversive means of internal corruption and population demoralization that they intend will achieve a critical mass of chaos and collapse. Demoralization means getting the population to abandon their morals, principles, and values that they would normally strongly defend against through media propaganda as well as infiltration of institutions and corrupting those from within. Typically, the useful idiots of those already disillusioned and angry can be mobilized with incendiary divisive narratives of race, gender, or class oppression mixed in with progressive advocacy of perversion, pedophilia, with particular attention given to corrupting the minds of vulnerable children to their ends before they obtain critical reasoning skills. Mix in an overdose of lethal drugs and normalization of drug abuse. Clearly, religion and strong families would oppose this, so they seek to divide families, ridicule religion, and preach only a secular obedience to the state that they are also simultaneously corrupting. They would use our own values of compassion and empathy against us. They would eradicate national identity and values by allowing the invasion of open borders and protecting the invaders who don't share our culture with sanctuary cities. They would seek to neuter the police, thereby normalizing crime and violence. They would keep the population in fear while promoting violence first, becoming a justified morality. They would call that and more of their targets of anarchy a justice among a great many other demoralizing perversions of language. They would censor opposing thoughts. Feelings would be replace science and truth. History would be malleable. State entitlements, dependence, and selective discriminatory privileges would replace hard work and merit, calling it again justice, equity, and inclusiveness. They would always seek to attack freedom, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness with ever more totalitarian control. Yes, there are other real American antithetical injustices at work destroying the nation besides them, meaning the deep state, power elite, and globalists, but they only have traction because of a corrupt and immoral government. You can choose not to do the dirty work of either. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Phillip. Anyone else uh, in chambers wish to provide oral communications to the board? Do we have anyone else online, Ms. Bush? We're finished with oral communications. Presiding officer announcements, I have none. Statements and disqualification. Anybody have a disqualification? Ms. Bruner. Uh, items number 25 and items number 26, as portions of them relate to my employment with the Downtown Association of Santa Cruz. Thank you, council member. Any other council member have a statement of disqualification? Thank you. Additions or deletions? Ms. Bush? <laughs> There are none. No additions or deletions. Mr. Condotti, closed session report. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mayor uh, Keeley, members of the City Council. There was one item on a very brief closed session this afternoon. That was a liability claim, the claim of Kathleen Gould. City Council received a report from its uh, risk manager. There was no reportable action. That item is also number eight on your consent calendar this afternoon. Thank you, sir. Let me see if uh, any actions on our council agenda. No changes, no. Thank you so much. We are in consent agenda. For those of you unfamiliar with this, we will be taking up items three through 21 inclusive on one motion. But in order to give people a chance to, to think
think about that and to comment upon it, what we'll be doing is first I will ask if there's any member of the council who wishes to comment on or pull an item on the consent agenda, then I will go to the public for the same purpose and then back to the council. So let me start through. Ms. Bruner, any items on consent? None. Ms. Contar Johnson. None. Ms. Watkins. Sure, I just have a brief comment for item number five. Certainly. You can make that at this time if you would like. Sure. sure. I just want to say um, thank you to my colleagues for now taking on this assignment and role. Um, it was brought to my attention that there's one more meeting in December where mm -hmm. the current uh, makeup of the committee will remain and there will be an orientation for all new members starting in February. So if you want to come to the meeting, you're welcome to, but it will officially transition over at the meeting in February is Very my good. understanding. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Brown. Items on consent. Yes, thank you, Mayor. I'd like to pull item 20. Such will be the order. We'll pull item 20. Okay. On a uh, couple of items on here. On item 4, uh, I want to thank Council Members Newsom and Brown for co-authoring this item regarding the public employee retirement system and their vast investment funds and asking them to disinvest from fossil fuels. Thank you very much for your work on that and thank you for to council members who I suspect are going to uh, going to support this item. Thank you for that. Uh, on item five, I want to thank you for your fine work uh, on on the policy board and uh, you've done great work on the council. Thank you for letting some other folks we'll see if we can Absolutely. fill your big shoes on that. But thank you so much. Uh, on uh, on item nine, uh, and the finance director and I have discussed this repeatedly. Uh, uh, I am comfortable with this investment management service contract because I am assured by the finance director that the basic principles in the law on municipal investment of safety, liquidity, and yield are exactly in that order what we are uh, asking uh, this contractor to engage in. We are, what we are not doing here is chasing yield. This is not about seeing if some consultant can get better yield for us. That's the least important part of managing public investment funds. I do think there are other reasons for going ahead with this, and I want to thank you for bringing this forward with that understanding that we are not inverting or changing uh, the priorities of how this uh, public agency invests its funds or manages its funds. But thank you for that, uh, Ms. Cavill. You're, you and your team do an excellent job on all fiscal matters for our city. Let me uh, see if there's anyone with us today who wishes to comment on a consent agenda item or ask that an item be pulled. Good afternoon again, sir. Yes, good afternoon. My name is yeah. still James Ewing. Um, it's my understanding that council members or lesser magistrates can pull items off the con consent agenda. So I would like to pull off number three Three. which has to do with the minutes, and I would like to pull off number four, which has to do with the CalPERS. And can I? So it's my understanding well, why that those Why don't we are... do this? You just go ahead and comment on them. We'll be glad I... to take your testimony now. Let's start with number three. Please feel free to make your comment on that. Well, I would like three minutes on each. Go ahead. And you would like me to do it right now. Take such time. Thank you so much. You're welcome. How about if I start with number four? Um, in relation to the CalPERS, I mean, I printed up. I'm glad I had the stuff with me. It's quite a bit of paperwork here, lots of pretty pictures, you know, and there's an incredible amount of propaganda. Um, I know some of you have complimented me on being polite, and that's not always accurate. Um, in 1892, John Rockefeller and a bunch of other criminals met in Geneva and decided, how can we take the second most plentiful fluid on planet Earth, oil, and create scarcity? So they created the fictitious term 
of fossil fuels. So almost everything else in here is somewhat irrelevant. If I were to go and do a line item, and I could, I mean, this is full of all kinds of pretty pictures and all kinds of propaganda. But what is being pushed as far as sustainability and, let's say, electric vehicles under what the norm is now, lithium ion, there's just, this is an incredible amount of propaganda. And I don't want to hurt or hurt or step on anybody's toes when I say this is mostly fictitious, absolute bullshit. Um, okay, I, I would prefer we elevate okay. that, that just a uh, bit. That's, Thank you, you know, I, I, I appreciate that. Okay. So in an effort to kind of dispel what's going on in the future, there are so many other options. And I do think it's wonderful that many different avenues to increase the financial health and wealth of the workers of this city are very important. But I'm not in that much of agreement with this. Okay, I'm done on number four. So now I get three minutes on number three. You do. This is great. How fun. <laughs> so it is. So number three actually has to do with the minutes of the meeting. Okay. And when I read the meeting, minutes of the meeting on Saturday, I, the, uh, mostly humor, you know. Um, there are several consistent individuals that speak here, some on the phone, some in person. Uh, I would imagine that if I were to call myself a meat puppet or a fifth element being or something, that would go into the official record. Um, so I was able to pull four items off the consent agenda. Number eight and number 10 were very similar. They had to do with the entities, and that's city and county managers, that control all of you. I've provided you with a copy. I have other information and a citizen's rule book. Um, number 12 had to do with more of the frequency weapon stuff, getting rubber stamp, excuse me, specifically more hardwired stuff. And number 16 had to do with me totally questioning the FDA and the EPA as far as their safety standards. I have some new information that when this goes online, there's up to 3 million gallons a day of treated sewage that are going to be going into the water table. The reason I'm up talking about the minutes is not only was that nothing was talked about as far as what I spoke upon on 8 or 10 or 12 or 16. So I mean I could have I suppose come unglued but uh, I have to apologize enough for putting my foot in my mouth. I don't want to intentionally do it. So. Um, I just think this is a great opportunity, and I appreciate being put on the spot. I mean, I want to talk on another item, but I do need to go back to work at some point. So thanks for this opportunity. Thank you again, sir. <laughs> Good afternoon. Hello. Good afternoon. My name is Susan Monheit, city resident. I would like to request that... From consent item number 25, mm -hmm. the additional height of the hotel and the revising, uh, the revising of additional height criteria. Hang on just one second for the, me. The um, 25 regular. is not part of the consent. It's regular agenda. So when we get to that, that's regular agenda, not consent it's agenda. It's been pulled off the consent agenda. Uh, it's not on the consent agenda, but... but uh, consent public hearing. Public hearing. Right. That'll be your opportunity when we get to that to make oh, these it's comments. Oh, in the public hearing, not uh -huh. in the consent agenda. And was it always that way, or did it recently get changed? It was always that way. It was it's, always yeah, that it's way. It's consent public hearings, which is just handled the same as consent. But okay. when we get there, that's when you can comment on it. All right. And it's number 25, so you'll be going through 24 uh -huh. other things. Yep. Thank you very much. You're certainly welcome. Good afternoon. 
Mr. Farrell, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mayor Keeley and council members. I'm here uh, for a short clarifying comment, hopefully on uh, the, con the minutes of the last meeting, specifically relating to uh, the condition that was placed on the 925 appeal about ceiling height being reduced from nine to eight feet. Yes. Uh, we would hope that clarifying that to say reducing the first floor ceiling height from nine to eight feet would uh, be acceptable to the council because we feel that's really the area that's going to be affected in the building. And the neighbors just wanted to say thank you, good council, for their consideration on this item. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Do we have anyone online? We do. What we're going to do is start toggling back and forth. Somebody online, somebody in person. So you'll be right after the next person online. Good afternoon, person online. Yes, hi, it's Garrett again. Hey, I have three items also to speak to, but two of them briefly. Uh, I have a, well, I suppose a different point of view than the mayor on item nine, uh, in that it would appear the finance department will get relieved of the job of managing investments of cash, and a consultant will then be paid a minimum of $40,000 a year for five years and probably far more to guide that process. Uh, maybe you have found a financial advisor that will consistently beat the current investment strategies, and maybe not, since the reality is few advisors do beat the market. The entry point in time for investment changes of do matter a lot. The gist of their advice is quite similar to most all of the recent standard advice of fixed income experts that have been saying for more than six months now that it's time to extend maturities and additionally stated uh, here to increase diversification. Taking that advice early in the year would have put all those investments uh, underperforming, even underwater. That kind of advice applies more so to investors with money to invest that don't need it back anytime soon and can wait out misallocations and avoid the uh, buy high, sell low scenarios uh, because they don't need the cash and they can wait for diversification to work to allow the various sectors to have their time in the sun because they're not all synced up, meaning enjoy returns of higher risk, which uh, does apply to fat cat cities uh, with the terms of their investment horizon, but not so much to some for their need for safety, which I'm thinking you do even more. Uh, and I would say I would categorize the advice as a fair uh, short-term gamble, but I think it, it will eventually need more management. It's not a buy and forget about it. Uh, we are past a historic inflection point in fixed income investing, a bond bear market, and coming up very possibly is a short head fake counter inflection and not, as your opinion states, that the rates are going to come back down and stay down. That is a short-term guess. It remains to be seen if they will be right or by how much or for how long and whether they have the wisdom to unwind those trades before possibly being very wrong in a few years. Five years is a long time. You extend maturities. You ate the stake. And anyone who says they know our interest rates are going to be in five years is lying or rates over 10 or 12 or 13 percent looking out seven or eight years is somehow impossible, even as our money becomes rapidly and continuously ever more worthless. Even the chart provided in your packet of future Fed action is outdated by their latest meeting. Not so long ago, who would have guessed the 10-year bond would have breached 5%? I don't care for their idea, if it is so, to liquidate all assets and invest all at once in the longer-term wide fixed income diversity applications at this time. Entry points in time matter, and there are forces besides short-term interest rates at work in all those other sectors besides shorter treasuries. This kind of snap diversification will require active management for a while, and you mean time for a while and maybe forever will be taking on more risk. I was amazed at reading you have $66 million that you don't need anytime soon. So events and yields not play out as expected. Uh, bottom line, it looks like you are paying more to reach for yield, taking on more risk. And if you were capitalized like a fat cat city, I think for the entire five years, you should publicly publish a comparison of what returns you would have had not doing this and ask uh, now if there are unrealized losses being realized when you liquidate. Otherwise, good luck, and of course, it can work out fabulous if these people are financial stages. If I could speak to briefly of two other things, as item 12, the fee consulting analysis contract, there goes the 140,000, and I'm sure you'll instruct them to get your money's worth milking the maximum possible cash cow public in every conceivable way. One wonders if the staff does anything or do consultants do it all. I mentioned comparisons to other cities never mean anything. It's your actual costs and fair value of services to consider. And of course, nothing in this says your cost versus service is optimal. 
the recent jacking of boat rail rates 100 percent was justified because some other cities were charging more comes to mind i never see any actions or evaluations that seek to achieve more optimal performance at cost maybe the public would be better served if you hired a consultant for that analysis in the end hiring consultants is essentially adding staff and cost cynically to me, it seems all like plausible deniability being constructed for when the astronomic fee increases are announced. How effective will this money be spent if they say you're charging too much in fees? Based on your phase one action so far, I'd say you don't have to worry about that. I'd put the odds of lowering fees at zero to minus, no matter what the actual costs really are. We'll see. As to item four, I don't see any evidence presented that your ESG retirement investment ideas will result in a better financial portfolio result for retired workers. It's similar to the confusion and ignorance woke ideologies concentrate on rather than the real world. Perhaps you should advise golfers not to invest in companies that don't demand woke usage of personal pronouns or don't engage in diversity hiring while you're at it. There has been a lot of attention to ESG investing since 2013. And yeah, some evidence exists that these, those have done well so far, but evidence now suggests a lot of ESG performance has been because of the investment attention and subscription they have received, that is to say momentum, and that other factors related to ESG investments would accomplish the same, and assumptions of continued performance may be unfounded. ESG funds may then be overbought, and you know what happens next after that normally in the financial world. If better investments end up having existed, I wonder how narrowing your investments uh, will comfort ideological shortcomings when, uh, when that, if that happens, will be to the retirees. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Hi. My name is Michelle Kibrick, and I'm here to speak in support of Agenda Item 4, the resolution on CalPERS divestment. I'm a resident of the city of Santa Cruz, and I live in Council District 4. I am also the co-chair of the Santa Cruz Dianu Service. Let's do this. Let's make sure you get really close to that microphone so oh. we can make sure we hear everything. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I'm also the co-chair of the Santa Cruz Dianu Circle. We're an interfaith climate action group that is affiliated with the National Dianu Organization, a Jewish call to climate action. We currently have eight local partner congregations spanning several faiths who all share a commitment to advocate for climate solutions and environmental justice. We strongly support the proposed resolution urging CalPERS to divest from fossil fuels and invest in sustainable energy instead. To stave off the worst effects of climate change, we need to shift our energy model away from fossil fuels now. Ensuring a healthy climate for ourselves and future generations is a moral imperative. I want to thank Mayor Keeley and Council Members Newsom and Brown and city staff for submitting this excellent res resolution for your consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Another person online, Ms. Bush. Nobody with their hand raised. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. My name is Steve Palmasano. I'm a resident of in District Six, and I'm here in to speak in support of Item Four, uh, Calpers divestment. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley and Council Members Newsom and Brown for bringing this item to Council. Thank you to Tiffany Wise West, who works with such passion and integrity year after year. She is such a local hero on climate action. And what a joy it is to see you again, Mr. Huffaker. We worked together for many years in Watsonville, and I just have to say we are so lucky to have him as our city manager here. He's an amazing individual. So. I never thought that after 28 years serving the city of Watsonville, including uh, 10 years as director of public works, I'd be on this side of the podium. And today I'm here as a representative of Dianu, the Interfaith Climate Coalition. As faith groups, we offer an opportunity to bring people together based on shared values in faith and to heal the polarization that is so common these days. And we come to you as partners to further our shared commitment in addressing the injustices caused by climate change. Pope Francis released a powerful statement two weeks ago urging stronger actions on climate. He writes, our responses have not been adequate, while the world in which we live is collapsing and may be nearing the breaking point. He continues, the most effective solutions will not come from individual efforts alone, but, but above all, from major political decisions on the national and international level. 
It has been very heartening to make a request of the council to bring this resolution to CalPERS and to receive such a positive response from you all. It is exactly how we change systems. Your responsiveness gives us great hope. This is democracy in action. We are the building blocks at the local level. As people of faith, we honor what science tells us, that what we decide today and every day for the next 10 years will, be, will determine the quality of life for all beings on this planet for the next 500 years and beyond. We humans now hold more responsibility than ever in our history. We are the ancestors of the next generations. That is why your action today matters so much. That is why in April, we wrote a letter to you encouraging you to increase the funding of the Climate Action Program. Now is the time to bring in more funding, more staff, and more legislative advocacy at the state and federal levels uh, for the environment and for climate. So today, I thank you so much for bringing this important and powerful statement of the city's values and leadership on climate justice. And I urge you to keep climate action as a top funding priority. And I also hope you will send out a press release on this item. Uh, one of the greatest tools in, in addressing climate change is simply getting people to talk about it. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for your input. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. I'm Robert Kibrick. I've lived in the city of Santa Cruz for the last 47 years, and I'm a resident of Council District 4. As a representative of the Santa Cruz Dayenu Circle and the Social Justice Committee of Temple Beth El, I want to register our strong support for the resolution on CalPERS divestment. I also want to thank Mayor Keeley and Council Members uh, Newsom and Brown and the city staff for, preparing, for the excellent work they did in preparing both the resolution and, importantly, the supporting documentation. Together, these documents make a compelling case why CalPERS should reduce and ultimately eliminate investments in fossil fuels while increasing its investments in sustainable and renewable energy. Please note that the fifth element of this resolution directs the council to encourage state legislation that ensures that public pension funds, such as CalPERS, are only investing in sustainable and renewable energy portfolios and are divesting from fossil fuels. One such piece of pending legislation is Senate Bill 252 by Senator Lena Gonzalez, which has passed the state Senate and is awaiting action in the assembly in the next legislative session. Assuming the council adopts this resolution today, we strongly urge you, uh, we so strongly urge the council to actively register its support for SB 252 and any related legislation in accordance with the provisions of this resolution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else who is with us today wish to comment? Anyone else online? Matters back before the council. Ms. Brown, you have asked for item 20 to be pulled. Would you like to deal with that now? We can do the consent agenda, go to your item. We'll do it that way. All right. So we are going to take up the consent agenda items that have not been pulled. Uh, is there a motion to approve as submitted? As I'll, I'll make the motion. Motion by Ms. Brown, second by Ms. Watkins. Ms. If, I, Brown. if I could ask um, uh, for clarification on the minutes, does that work to um, make that clarification? I think that was the intention, um, the clarification that um, the appellant asked for. Thank you. Uh, I, just on that note, I will confirm the conditions of approval were worded correctly. We will just match that to the minutes. Yeah. Thank you. And um, I, I do like the idea of sending out a press release on this uh, adoption of this resolution. So I would uh, hope to add that as direction as well. Okay. Sounds good. good. Thank you. Further on the consent agenda debate or discussion, seeing here none, the clerk will call the roll. Council Member Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Palantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder is absent, and Mayor Keeley. Aye. 
Motion passes and so ordered. We are on item 20, Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mayor. So this item is uh, regarding a retain work to be done on a retaining wall on Archer Drive. I, um, I wanted to just provide a little bit of context for my colleagues here on this item and make a request and um, possibly ask for some uh, input from Public Works as well. So the, um, the work is going to be done primarily uh, funded through a USDA grant that the uh, property owner researched and found, and, um, and I did talk with them quite a bit, and also with uh, representatives from the city. Thank you for being responsive and, and actually moving through that process. They needed a government agency to uh, officially apply for that uh, assistance. There, you'll see in the agenda report that there is an additional cost related, obviously there will be additional costs related to the work, and I just wanted to um, make a, a, a recommendation and a request that we consider uh, making this uh, a little more viable for the applicant. I haven't spoken with them since they got their project um, kind of moving through the USDA process, but um, it occurred to me based on what I know of their circumstances that um, that, that is a, a major uh, cost, approximately $104,000. Um, since the retaining wall will protect Bay Drive from runoff and uh, in the event of a future potential landslide, um, it feels like the city benefit um, would warrant some contribution from us as well. And so um, I'd like to ask if uh, we might consider a 50-50 cost split on that additional, um, the 104,000. This is in-kind contribution, really, because it's staff time. So there's not a, an impact to the general fund. I recognize that it affects your, your workload in public works. And so I wanted to, um, to just put that out there. It feels like that would be uh, reasonable for us to share the cost uh, on the, the additional uh, expenses there. So um, I see... Uh, so the gentleman has a comment on this? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Crossley, City Engineer. Um, I would potentially challenge the statement that there's not an impact on the general fund. And what I mean by that is that we do have a couple of city staff working on this. One of them is a retired uh, annuitant that's come back and works part-time for us. And so uh, that's a source of staff time. Also, there would be uh, an assistant engineer, a junior engineer working on this. We haven't identified that staff yet. Uh, we have fairly complex staffing form funding formulas in public works, so uh, it's not quite as straightforward maybe as it may seem on the surface. So uh, I appreciate that, uh, and and I recognize. Yeah, there is. There's always a cost to the, the general fund. I, I'm just, to, but and it's interesting to hear that you will need to bring on a, a additional staff for this project in particular. Um, again, I, I'm hoping that we can see our way to some kind of cost share. I see uh, Director Wynn is approaching the the dais, and I, I I I just I guess I'd like to ask: Is there a way that we could we could help reduce the burden on the property owner here. It feels like um, we're, it's kind of a squeeze um, for this, given that we're going to benefit at the city as well. The Public Works yeah. Director is recognized. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor, members of the <coughs> council members. Um, that's a great question with regards to the value of this project. The, the retaining wall that failed during the January uh, storms uh, was on private right of way, and that the failure did occur adjacent to the hillside on Bay Avenue. The improvements that are being proposed, uh, this retaining wall, uh, roughly a cost of 350000 plus an additional cost for design, um, really is a major benefit for the private property owner versus the actual uh, public right of way. Our engineers went out and evaluated the slope on Bay Drive and initially found that it was stable and that the failure really occurred again on the private right of way due to storm drains that were being clogged that caused too much head and pressure on that existing retaining wall. And so as an effort on our part, additional as with the 
as a response and request to evaluate whether they would qualify for this USDA funding. We did dedicate some staff resources, as uh, Kevin mentioned, and we are willing to dedicate some additional staff resources, but really at the expense of the property owner, because as we view the improvement as much more on the private right-of-way side than it is for uh, Bay Drive itself. So just a, another uh, question then related to the, the process for the, the app. I understand. Um, I'm, I'm disappointed. I, you know, I hope that the, I imagine the work will, will happen anyway, and, and that would be a real risk to the city if it didn't happen, I think, potentially in the future. Um, so, and, and I do think that we're benefiting. We will benefit. <laughs> so I, I think we should share some of the cost. It sounds like you feel that what has been contributed thus far at the staffing level and I do very much appreciate that uh, because I wasn't sure that we were going to get there, um, that that was uh, a significant share of the cost. So the question I have then is, um, in terms of, of payment, you're asking for that payment up front, I believe. Um, is, is there a way to, to it, I just would hate to see this project um, be delayed or there be problems kind of implementing because that is a big cost to come up with up front. And I don't know if the applicants are in that position to do that, but is if if they are not, can they pay you over time? Is that a possibility? So the, uh, the current progress is the applicants seeking a loan to cover their cost share, and it's in the full amount that they're going to be uh, obligated to cover. Um, our concern with setting up like a repayment schedule was that this is a fairly small project in the big scheme of things, and so we're talking about a month, you know, like three month long project. Um, it, it put the city in the position of having to figure out how to float the project costs uh, without any city contrib contribution to the overall uh, fund. So it, it felt to us cleaner just to ask for their share up front as a commitment that they're ready to do this project. But you've worked it out so that they they have a way forward for that. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'll um I'm I'm disappointed, but I'll go ahead and um, you know uh, approve the the item. I guess I'll make the. Oh no, I have to wait. For, are you making a motion? I was going to wait till public comment. If there's okay. Anybody else. All right. Anybody else on this item? Members of the council on this item. I have a quick question. Please do. If I may ask, Council Member Brown, you brought up that there was significant risk to the city, but what I'm hearing from Public Works staff is that it's more risk to the private or benefit and less a risk to the city. So, absolutely. Where, what are you getting your information from? I, I, my information, I, I was just suggesting a cost share that seemed like it would be reasonable given that there is public benefit um, and the city is in a position to um, support, I believe, uh, support infrastructure that helps, uh, you know, de defend, mitigate uh, those kinds of risks, landslide in particular risks in this case for the city. So um, I didn't have, my information was simply that this is a project that is going to benefit the city because if that work isn't done and the retaining wall further fails, it will slide onto city onto public property and affect Bay Drive. So we are at risk in that in this case. Council member, can you speak to that? Sure. Um, as uh, Director Nguyen summarized, the majority of the benefits are going to be accrued by the property owner. There is going to be ongoing erosion and threat of additional landslides if nothing is done. Uh, that, that could put us in a stickier situation, I would say, legally that I don't want to speculate on. That would be more in the city attorney's domain than uh, what, the, what the resolution would look like if we weren't supportive of this project moving forward. Other council members, questions, comments? Let me see if I understand this correctly. There is a shared benefit here, or there is benefit to the city, as benefit to the private property owner. The private property owner and the city have gone and applied for this funding. Funding has been approved. There are certain match requirements in that. And if I understand Councilmember Brown's point, it is that given that there are benefits both on the public and private sector, perhaps the public and private sector should share this in some way. But what I don't think we've gotten to is the discussion, is that a 75-25, is that a 50-50? What is that? But I think she makes a reasonable policy point. Can I make a proposal? 
Please do. We haven't recouped any staff time cost on this yet. Uh, that was part of what we were intending to take out of the deposit that the private property owner was going to provide us. What we could do is absorb those costs to get the project to this point and only recharge staff time moving forward as a as a concession. Is there a motion to that effect, Ms. Brown? Yes, there is. So There's moved. There's a motion. Is there a second? <laughs> motion and a second. Debate or discussion? Anyone wish to testify on this? Seeing and hearing none, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Turner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder is absent, and Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes, Mr. Water. Thank you all very much. Uh, we are on the consent public hearing. Uh, for those of you unfamiliar with it, we'll be taking up items 20 through to 25. Uh, we, uh, if you wish to comment on those items, this would be the opportunity to do so. Ask if there are comments on the council. Well, I'd like to pull item 25. I item think 25. that yes. we'll have more to discuss there. And that would be the item you'd have to read. And, and I have a comment on 24. 24? Comment Please question. Comment. So um, item 24 is the Beach Flats uh, grant application. This is... Uh, um, uh, into, go ahead. I'm so sorry. I think there was confusion about whether or not Councilmember Bruner should stay, given she has to recuse herself. So since I've been 20, 25 has been pulled. Pulling 25. 25. Pulled. So you're fine. So we're, we're going to take that separately. So now it's 22, 23, 24. You got it. Okay, comment on 24. Yeah, I, uh, so it's it's a comment and a question. Uh, the Beach Flats grant application here is um, it's a large proposal. I'm I'm very glad to see it, um, and it is intended to address uh, or create a process for addressing um, and engaging uh, the community in uh, resilience and uh, other kind of infrastructure and other improvements. Um, also trying to address a displacement of residents in uh, who who live in the beach flats area. We know it's a historically kind of underrepresented uh, low income community. It's why it, we're eligible for this grant. Um, and you know, I, given that we know displacement is already occurring, I feel it's really crucial that affected neighbors are fully involved. Uh, the proposal, at least the overview we've received, is. Um, kind of suggests that there will be CBOs and, uh, that are involved in this, will partner to engage with the community, there will be community meetings, um, but it's not really explicit about how that will be accomplished. And I, um, I would like to um, just ensure that we, we really prioritize that. Um, one thing I'd really like to see, and I'm not gonna make a motion about this here, but we've been talking for a while and the Planning Commission uh, a while back did uh, suggest uh, a displacement task force, an anti-displacement task force that we establish some kind of body to um, work on these issues. And I feel like this is a place where that conversation needs to be had in full. So um, I'm, I'm just, um, you know, I'm not asking for a major addition here, but I would like for uh, perhaps the staff to um, give us, uh, as I think about this now, what seems like it would make sense would be to um, provide the council with that engagement plan, a fully detailed engagement plan, should we receive this grant, so that we can be aware of how it's being implemented, we can participate in getting uh, you know, neighbors involved and um, council member Newsom, this being in your district, I'm happy to work with you when the time comes to, you know, try to support that. So just would like to see something so we know what that outreach and engagement is going to look like, um, who's involved. Could I, would that be all right with the council to ask for a report on that? Do you want to add that as I would like to add that item? just as addition, just a brief additional uh, Without objection, recommendation that be added. Without objection, further on item 24. Mayor and Council, if I may, sure. I did want to just note that Tiffany Wise West, one of the staff on this project, has her hand raised. Oh well, oh, Tiffany. I'm sorry. Then. Excuse me. Please. But we can just hear it now. Dr. Wise West on yes. this. Good afternoon. Yes, Dr. thank Dr. you, Mayor. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you, uh, Council Member Brown, for that question. To your question about the CBOs, it is explicit uh, in the detailed application 
each of the CBO's roles in the project, which include um, a project advisory, as well as uh, connecting us to community. And also both of the uh, major elements of the project do call for an integrated engagement plan uh, developed at the beginning of the project. So I think everything that you mentioned is covered. Um, I was not aware of the task force and uh, if there's something, you know, clearly that is uh, related and would benefit this, that is no problem for us to integrate. I just would need some details on this. Um, as part of this 15 day review period, um, we are able to make minor adjustments to our application based on the feedback that we do receive. So um, I'd like to follow up with you uh, to gain clarity on that task force so that we can appropriately uh, modify the application to include that. that. That sounds great. Thank you, Dr. Wise West. I'll follow up with you offline on that. Um, and that, so I guess we don't really need to include additional, rec um, or I, I don't feel the need to, um, but it, it would be great to get uh, an update on that process directly to the council um, as that, that work is being done. So we just know how we can also participate and facilitate others to participate. Thanks. Thank you. Absolutely. We, we, we did include also uh, several checkpoints with council, just FYI. We're, we're on the same page there. Thank you, Dr. Weiswas. We appreciate that. So you have no additional uh, direction on that. All right. Yes. Mr. Newsom, sir. Thank you, Mayor Keeley. I just want to make a quick comment on item number 22. Uh, 22. Please, I just want to thank uh, Director Lipscomb and Development Manager DeWitt for bringing this uh, agenda item forward. Uh, these properties are in my district and they provide 68 uh, housing units for extremely low, very low and low income uh, families. Uh, and I'm just really excited to see this uh, agenda item and I just want to thank them for this. Thank you, sir. Any further questions, comments on the consent agenda public hearing item? I say what we have remaining on that is 22, 23, and 24. We have pulled item 25. Let me ask if there's anyone with us who wishes to make comments on items 22, 23, or 24. Anyone online? We do. Let's go to the person online. Good afternoon. Yes, this is Garrett. I'll comment on 24. I didn't have to scroll to the bottom of this item to know who submitted this. Hey, see you later there. Go somewhere. Anyway, while the relative blight of beach flats and its proximity to potential flood damage being real concerns and its redevelopment into something better seems a most very worthwhile endeavor, what is defined as better is sadly slathered here with leftist ideology and goals, not something I appreciate. It's another example of, worse I would say, of taking the bribe similar to that REAP 2.0 grant that seeks to destroy single-family housing forever, whether the public really wants it or not, meaning taking the big outside money that creates questions of loyalty. Yes, California is leftist central and is going into the waste bin of misguided blue states with the ideologies leading to policies and economics that don't work, evidenced by mass homelessness, normalization of crime and invasion, and a free ride for protected illegal immigrants, by high taxes and fees, businesses and public moving out of the state, having truly un-American ideologically and ineffective policies like price controls and forcing a homogenization and destruction of communities according to authoritarian state-conceived formulas. Santa Cruz suffers from a concentration of low-paying hospitality industries, too many low-paying nonprofits, a high concentration of government workers, an embedded leftist educational indoctrination facility, too much government dependence, as well as flat out too many socialist, communists, and cultural Marxist believers intent on installing their defective ideologies into repressive policy. When affordable housing means price-controlled housing, that's defective socialism. When removing barriers that perpetuate segregation mean destroying micro-community neighborhoods to a lowest common denominator state that have collectively worked hard to achieve success in their version of the American dream, uh, when it is assumed there are immoral and illegal barriers to so-called protected classes to live in so-called well-resourced areas defined as having some magic superior opportunity due to physical location alone being denied to those based on a simple demographic reality and not on a lack of individual responsibility in achieving income success, we have cultural Marxists at work here and in Sacramento to pushing their destructive agenda. 
throw in offensively assumptive leftist buzzwords like underprivileged, underserved, underrepresented, climate justice, decarbonizes housing, and achieving equity, as effective a concept as that is, by funneling money to one-sided activist groups. Again, I didn't have to scroll to the bottom to see who submitted this. I can see why, for their own financial interests, various corporations are for this. If the leftist garbage ideology was removed, I would be a lot in favor of this. You should send this whole thing back for a rewrite by a neutral, not politically motivated, unelected bureaucrat that doesn't have leftist ideology policy injection on the brain and give this sucker a left lobotomy, but you probably won't. I'm still waiting for you to acknowledge and write that resolution to send to our Congress and our recently appointed diversity gender placeholder senator residing the last 19 years in Maryland to stop increasing wealth inequality by the immoral and corrupt inflation produced by immoral spending that is the real cause of existential economic wealth inequality and waste instead of the endless misguided ineffective social justice injustice band-aids being prescribed. Thanks. Thank you, sir. For the comments on... 22, 23, 24. We have another person online. Good afternoon, person online. Hello. Good afternoon, Mayor, Ke Mayor afternoon. Keeley and Council. My name is like to provide a comment in support of item 24, Central Coast Energy Services, Community Action Board of Santa Cruz County, and Community Bridges. Our organization, Central Coast Energy Services, is a nonprofit that provides utility bill assistance and home energy upgrades to low crockers, including those living in the beach flats. We strongly believe that this project represents a vital step towards addressing the pressing issues of inadequate affordable housing and increasing climate change impacts on our low-income communities. As concerned members of the community, we believe it is imperative that the city prioritizes and invests in initiatives such as this one that can provide stability and security to our low-income neighborhoods and community members by way of improving the housing stock and reducing climate inequities. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. Anyone else online? One more person online. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, hello. Uh, this is Judy Young, Senior Account Manager with Central Coast Community Energy, and I am here to comment on item 24. 3CE enthusiastically supports the City of Santa Cruz's Pathways to Removing Obstacles to Housing grant application, and it is our intent to partner with the city on this important initiative. 3CE is a California Community Choice Aggregation Load Serving Entity whose mission is to provide reliable, affordable, clean energy and electrification programs to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and strengthen our local economy. In 2018, the City of Santa Cruz City Council voted to join 3CE via Joint Powers Authority, marking the commencement of our ongoing partnership. The proposed Bolstering Climate and Housing Resiliency in Santa Cruz project further furthers our mutual goals of removing barriers to housing and promoting electrification in our community. 3CE's governing boards have identified electrification as a strategic goal, recognizing that all electric buildings are cost-effective, highly efficient, provide cleaner indoor air quality, and substantially lower operational emissions than buildings that use natural gas appliances. 3CE offers rebates and incentives to facilitate the replacement of specific gas appliances in existing residences and to stimulate the construction of all electric new accessory dwelling units and affordable housing. Understanding that electrification may present challenges for certain members of the community, 3CE extends additional incentives tailored to income qualified customers. In alignment with our commitment to these principles, we extend our wholehearted support for the City of Santa Cruz's visionary initiative, and we are eager to participate in 16 quarterly meetings over four years, offering our expertise and guidance in an advisory capacity. Our objective is to facilitate the seamless integration of this project with 3CE's overarching goals, which are twofold, advancing building electrification and investing in our underserved residential customers that form the backbone of our communities. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? No one else hand. Okay. If I just might say that uh, Mr. Huffaker serves on the operations board of 3CE. I happen to 
have the good fortune of serving on the policy board and uh, my way of thinking about this, if we did everything else in the climate change space to try to address that issue and we didn't change the fuel type in generating electricity and the fuel type in transportation, we're going to fail miserably as a world in that. And so uh, 3CE is uh, an absolutely critical element in the Monterey Bay area for our climate change objectives. So uh, thank you to the staff person who called in on that. Further questions or comments? Do we have anyone else online? Okay, matter is back before the council. I do believe we have a motion and a second. We will get one if you need one. Right. Well, a motion by Mr. Newsom, a second. Well, you just showed up. Second okay. by the vice mayor. There we go. Uh, uh, lest you think the mayor, uh, the vice mayor is late. She had, she is a principal of a school here and her official duties in both places have a tug push pull on it. So thank you for being here. I know you had other matters, but there, we do have a motion and a second debate and discussion, Ms. Brown. I just wanna uh, really, send a shout out to Dr. Wise West, uh, because I didn't say that earlier. Uh, your work to um, bring resources into our community for really, really critical issues, your uh, attention to and commitment to including affected communities in those conversations is really unparalleled. So uh, I wanna appreciate that before we take the vote. Thanks. Thank you, council member. All debate damage and cease. Clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Um, Brown? Aye. Watson? Aye. Bruner? Aye. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Item 25 has been pulled, and we will take that item up now. Separately, we will begin with a report from our planning director, and uh, we will proceed to pace after that. Good afternoon, sir. <laughs> Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I'm Lee Butler, Director of Planning and Community Development. And um, as this item was on consent, um, we don't typically have a, a presentation. We do have a presentation prepared. Um, if you would like to go through those, I'm, I'm seeing some. Let me tell you, heads. I believe that this is uh, going to take some time. I think we are going to receive a fair amount of input. So let's have a less than 10 minute presentation. If you're ready to do so, I think that will help us set some context on this. Great. Uh, our you, senior sir. planner, Ryan Bain, will pull up that presentation and... Good afternoon, Mr. Dane. Good Thanks. afternoon, sir. Thanks. Good afternoon. Um, so yes, what we have before you is a uh, um, proposal for downtown plan amendments. So uh, the downtown plan is, is really a dynamic document that is updated every few years. So here we are again, uh, kind of continuing that cycle. Um, so as part of the updates, what we're attempting to do here is to streamline the processes to minimize uh, unnecessary delays for uses downtown, um, updating standards that have proven to be problematic, ensuring consistency um, throughout the many sections of the plan and updating the plan to address recent state law uh, changes. So, and just to add a little clarification, we did receive um, correspondence over the last day or so, and I think there was some confusion about what we're proposing or some of the proposals as part of this, so I just wanted to clarify that we're not proposing to apply state density bonus to non-residential or commercial projects. Um, so commercial projects such as office buildings or hotels cannot apply density bonus and increase the height 
um, or use waivers to development standards. So I just wanted to clarify that. Um, also, we're not increasing the permitted height of buildings downtown, um, with the exception of the limited structures that involve uh, activated rooftop amenities, which I'll, I'll get to. So um, the proposal went to Planning Commission on September 21st, and Planning Commission recommended approval on a four to one vote. Um, there were two minor revisions, one being that um, removing the reference to the specific affordability amount, since that it's now 20%, it was 15%. So we're just, they, they requested that we just remove that um, so we don't have to amend it every time um, the affordability requirements do change uh, and possibility in the future. Um, also, there was some added Coastal Commission recommended language that um, I won't go into detail, but it's in the staff report. So kind of going into just some of the general um, amendments, we're looking to eliminate uh, administrative use permits for ground floor supportive and transitional housing uh, and small, large family daycare, as well as upper floor multifamily residential uses. Um, this would bring the plan in consistency with state law uh, and simplify and streamline certain residential uh, projects. Um, we often get a lot of inquiries about uh, different types of commercial entertainment uses downtown, and uh, currently that's a little limited on how it's described. So we're expanding that use to include arcades, billiard halls, and indoor recreation uses. So um, we're also amended the footnote to require those uses um, have active ground floors just be visible from the street frontage to kind of keep that activity along the street frontage and downtown area. Um, also for ground floor, um, looking to amend uh, the ground floor footnote for multifamily housing to include supportive and transitional housing and flexible density units um, to limit the frontage of residential lobbies and leasing areas in the ground floor in the Pacific Avenue Retail District and to provide other clarifying language. Um, flexibility density um, units were recently added to the zoning code. Um, so this is providing consistency with the downtown plan. And also, as I mentioned, there we're limiting um, the uses of residential lobbies along Pacific Avenue to keep that, that activity along, along Pacific. Um, also proposing to amend the regulations for hotels and motels. Um, eliminating language regarding the location of hotels and prohibiting hotels on ground level frontages and along the river walk level frontage. Um, this change reflects previously approved changes made by the city council um, back in 2017 that were inadvertently left out of the Coastal Commission's previous local coastal program uh, approval. So we're basically updating that for consistency with what was approved previously. Um, also looking to amend the additional height zone criteria um, to remove language um, that is redundant um, in regards to density bonus law, which already allows an additional height waiver um, for height restrictions. Also amending uh, the additional height zone B criteria language to eliminate the language by including a concentration of new housing. Um, the existing language really is overly limiting as it only takes into consideration projects um, that include housing, which is not consistent with city policies that encourage visitor serving uses in the downtown and specifically within the coastal zone, um, nor is it consistent with policies of the downtown plan and general plan that support a mix of uses in the downtown as a means to support economic and, and cultural activities. Um, also adding a section regarding rooftop amenities, um, such as gardens, rooftop bars, pools, um, because really open space is very limited in the downtown area, so we wanted to be able to encourage rooftop uses um, in the downtown area. Uh, these basically would be allowed to be up to a 15-foot height above the maximum height. They have to be set back 15 feet and then would be limited to 15% of the rooftop area. Um, also, working with the Parks and Recreation Department, um, they were looking at, they've been looking at doing some amendments to the downtown area that um, regarding amending tree species lists for more flexibility as well as tree locations. So that, there's some language that's been amended um, to accommodate that as well. So the amendments are consistent with the general plan policies. They streamline both residential and visitor serving development and support overall economic development in the downtown. It's also consistent with the local coastal plan 
that there are portions of the downtown that are in the coastal zone. So there is an LCP amendment that is part of this, and it's consistent with those with the LCP policies that are listed in the staff report. There was an addendum to the 2017 Downtown Plan Amendment Program EIR that's been prepared and is attached to your staff report. Um, there's no new impacts than previously discussed and analyzed and no new mi mitigation measures. And it does not include secret review. This, I should note that this does not preclude secret review for any new projects that are gonna be in the downtown. So in terms of next steps, um, so if, the, if these amendments are to be approved, the edits will take effect in the areas outside of the coastal zone, um, but there are portions that um, that are in the coastal zone that will have to go on to Coastal Commission for LCP um, amendment approval. So I won't read the entire recommendation, but basically staff's recommending that the council adopt the resolution approving the amendments, as well as adopt the resolution authorizing uh, us to go ahead and submit for the LCP amendment to the Coastal Commission. And I'm available for any questions. Thank you, sir. Let me ask if there are questions by council members to begin this round conversation. Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the presentation. I, I do have a couple of questions. I have comments, which I'll uh, make later. And I, I believe there are members of the public who may also generate additional questions. But I, so I, I just want to ask now, uh, on the, the rooftop amenities item, uh, or, or element of this, is the, aside from the height, increased height allowance, is there anything that we are, isn't this, I guess I'm just asking, isn't this already allowable rooftop? I mean, we have rooftop amenities on buildings in the downtown um, already. And so I'm just wondering if there's anything in addition to the height increase that that would deliver uh, that is being changed here from our existing guidelines. Yeah, I don't think there's anything that prohibits um, rooftop amenities currently, um, but it would allow for some for that 15 foot additional height just for for certain minor structures. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, thank you. I'll leave it there for now. Thanks. Other questions or comments to start with around the dais here. Okay. This would be the opportunity for anyone who would like to provide input or testimony on this item. Ms. Bush, let me ask, uh, do we see yet that we will have anyone online? We do. Ms. Monheit, why don't we start with you and then we'll toggle back and forth in person and online. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Susan Monheit. I'm a resident of Santa Cruz, the city of Santa Cruz. So I just heard a couple of things run by. Uh, first of all, I'd like to state that um, that the description as it is in the agenda does not uh, give citizens adequate understanding of what this proposal is. I heard the words flexible density is now on the table to approve for downtown. I think flexible density is a really bad idea. It is creating the densest housing in, I believe, the county. Um, near Arana Gulch, something that would have been slated for about 50 units, now going to hold maybe three times that amount. I know we want density around the transit hub, but this making unlivably small, dense units is not the way to do it. I think I heard no CEQA will be required in any further developments downtown. Was that correct, sir? No. Could you restate that? I'll tell you what, you can ask those questions through oh, me and I'll that. be glad to then okay, direct so those to Okay, so I believe I heard there, there would be no further CEQA downtown, which I would object to. Um, those disclosures are important for the public. And 15 feet additional. So how about we do this? I think you had a question to me about that question. Can you stop so the clock? now go to the, uh, your, your time is not being, don't worry about okay. it. Okay. You're, you're going to be fine. Thank you. Sir? Yeah, sorry if there was a... Um, Miscommunication. So what I was saying was there was CEQA that was done for this for these amendments, and then what I was clarifying is that because the CEQA for these amendments has been done does not exclude new projects that come downtown. Those will still require CEQA review. Thank you for that clarification. Certainly. Please proceed. Okay. I missed one word there. Fifteen. Now 
This is confusing. Are you rezoning the downtown to allow 15 additional feet on any structure that's downtown? And shouldn't the 15 additional feet been accounted for in the building proposal for the new hotel? Which would, since uh, floors are about 15 feet, this would be effectively a 13th story. Wait, I mean, no, eight stories. It would be effectively another story. Okay, so that sounded like a question. I'll direct that over to staff. Um, it's as proposed with the amendments, there's no additional height being permitted outside of the amenities section that we're talking about. And just to clarify, those are for minor structures. There's limitations where it has to be set back 15 feet, no more than 50% of the rooftop area, 15 foot height. Um, and those are for, those aren't to be um, for housing, or I should say for uh, conditioned space. It's basically for a covered area for like a, either be a rooftop bar or you know seating area for next to a pool or something like that. So more of a than a many <laughs> more than yeah actual enclosed space. I don't know if I would consider that an additional story per se, but it could be construed that way, I suppose. Thank you. Please proceed. Okay. Thank you. Um, well, Lee, um, Mr. Lee Butler caught me on the way in to protest that this is not about applying density bonus laws to hotels downtown. But there's a question in my mind because this amendment would remove the inclusion of necessary two affordable units in order to allow it to increase the height 15 feet or 20 feet. And then on the slide, it said density bonus. So please explain that. Got it. Understand the question, sir. I don't know if I fully understood that question, but do you want to speak to that? <laughs> I, have to, I have to say it really fast. So I take more time. So um, right now, the findings associated with the additional height include a provision that state that um, the additional height findings um, require a concentration of housing, which a concentration of housing is some number of housing units. You know, that could be two, three, four units. Um, so if an office building or a hotel um, wanted to come in and go from that 50 feet to 70 feet in height, they would have to have a concentration of housing, meaning some portion of that building would have to be um, dedicated towards housing. That proposal is uh, recommended to be removed from this um, for the reasons that Ryan stated in the presentation, which we can go through again if the council has questions regarding that. And then with respect to the density bonus, the uh, there is one section in this that removes a reference to density bonus. Um, however, that is immaterial. Um, it has zero effect on residential, commercial, um, hotel, office. Um, it um, is in the additional height zone, and it says um, the additional height from 50 to 70 feet can be accomplished if you are on a lot of a certain size or if you have a lot if you have development on either side or um, uh, one other criteria and then it also says or if you're applying the density bonus the density bonus applies regardless the density bonus if you have a residential project that is providing a certain level of affordability whether or not you are seeking that 50 to 70 foot height exception density bonus applies to either one of those and so it's actually just confusing to have that reference to density bonus in that section, so that's being stricken. There is no other um, uh, no other implication for density bonus in these changes. And as many of the um, people who were writing in were um, concerned about that there was some kind of application of density bonus to the hotel, uh, that is a separate project that is not before the council today, that will be at some point in the future. That has no bearing on uh, density bonus. That hotel and density bonus have no connection whatsoever. Thank you, sir. 
Ms. Plant, hi, here's what we're going to do. Just to please come up. I have 19 seconds, yes. Yeah, I wanted to make sure you knew you had more time, so go ahead. I have another question. What, is the land on which this hotel is being proposed not city property that should have been slated for housing uh, near a metro station and then shouldn't uh, affordable housing criteria apply? Stop the clock. Sir. Um, that, I, I think someone from economic development might be here to answer that question, but uh, I'm not involved actually. Oh, there's Catherine. Thank you, Catherine. Hi. Good afternoon, council members and mayor. The property in question is under uh, discussion and review for use in a very specific project. Not, and uh, we certainly know about the Surplus Land Act and look to our uh, city attorney to advise and to monitor that we're following it. But that, again, is specific, specific to a particular project and not to the agenda item at hand, which is the general plan amendments. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Ms. Bonheit. In my last four seconds. I propose and encourage the City Council to not raise the height of the building and have that 15 feet be included in the height that was already proposed. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you very much. Do we have anyone online, Ms. Bush, on this item? We do. We'll go to the person online. Good afternoon. Hi, this is Rick Longinati. Um, folks, this is a, a measure to change the existing downtown plan. The downtown, the existing downtown plan calls for housing along the east side of Front Street. 60% of the building square footage should be housing. And that was written at a time, I guess, when we thought we had a housing problem and now we're changing policy. Um, I, I don't see a justification for that. Um, and moreover, there's uh, a Senate bill, which is SB 330, which uh, says that it prohibits a jurisdiction from downsizing property for housing unless the jurisdiction concurrently upzones other property to make sure that there's no net loss in residential capacity citywide. I don't see any proposal to concurrently upzone another part of the city, and yet we're losing capacity on the east side of Front Street, according to this proposal. So I don't think these downtown amendments would be legal. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else who's with us? Please come forward. And while that gentleman's coming forward, do we have anyone else online? How many? Uh, one. one. Okay. Good afternoon again. Yes, hello. My name is still James Ewing. Um, yeah, I want to comment on 25. I took some time to read number 26, and that's why I stayed. But looking at it again, that is temporary. So there's no reason to stay and comment on this. But what I find interesting about 25, and although I haven't read every single word that's in it, there's something that's repeated three times. So, hey, nobody's brought it up except Sandy Brown kind of did. So downtown plan amendments related to removing public hearing requirements. One, downtown plan amendments include but not limited to removing public hearing requirements. Third time, downtown plan amendments related to removing public hearing requirements. You know, this is some general thing that uh, kind of reminds me of BlackRock, you know? It's uh, really another layer of removing the people that actually live here, the people that actually voted for you city council members, where you guys are under the control of international organizations and you guys are like puppets. So I'm glad I stayed. I'm trying to be as polite as possible, but it's repeated three times, removing the public's public hearing. So what else is going on here? That's enough. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. I think that uh, I would ask you uh, about that point because I think it does the way the gentleman has articulated. It does give that impression. So on this, these amendments that you're talking about with regard to public hearings, how are we assuring the public that their right to make comment on projects and that kind of thing is not somehow being taken away from them? Yeah, I think um, for most projects downtown, a design permit is still going to be required. 
So there will still be some sort of, there will be a, a type of review um, for any projects downtown. And um, I think basically the idea is just streamlining residential um, and encouraging residential downtown. Um, but uh, yeah, just with these amendments, it's not to say that there won't be any review whatsoever. There still will be some type of permit required. And so let's go to the some type of, can you expand on that? Thank you, sure. sir. Eric Marlatt, Assistant Director. Um, most downtown projects have a variety of entitlements included with them. Some are density bonus. Those always have a public hearing. Um, sometimes there's maps associated with condominiums. Those always require a public hearing. We also have our community outreach policy. So even if we have a, d a project that's just a design permit that could be administratively approved, the public is afforded that notice through our community outreach policy, and then they can appeal that on up um, and have a hearing on it. So what we would generally, I think general conception would be that, that projects, I don't think people think of you know one house someplace, whatever it might be. We're, we're talking about downtown and, and, and projects. And I think what that creates in people's mind is some multi-story, multi-something, something there. Uh, and I think the comments a gentleman made wanting to make sure that the public is not disenfranchised from being able to provide its input, comment in a timely manner that could then affect the project. That's right. And, and the other point I should make, too, is right now a lot of these residential projects have a use permit requirement. And that really doesn't make sense. I mean, most of the discussion around these projects have to do with, with design, and, and that's being covered under the design review. Um, we're really not going to be in the position of revoking or modifying a, a residential project under a use permit. So um, it's, it's just sort of superfluous process. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. We have someone online. Is that correct? We'll take uh, the next one online. Then we'll be with you. We'll toggle back and forth a bit. So good afternoon, person online. Three, two, one. Good afternoon. Hello? Yep. Come on. Come on forward. Hi. We'll, t we'll take you in a minute. Please come forward. We'll take you person online. Be ready to go when we're when we call on you. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Allison Buckter. I've been here about 23 years, and I have two um, things I'd like to say. One, I'd like to have more public input. So when the gentleman before me mentioned it was three times mentioned in here, I would ask if you could please take that out, and that you could have um, more public input. I know that. I filled out a survey due September 1st about what kind of amenities around the 12-story buildings. No one ever asked whether the public wanted 12-story buildings at all. So when you have public outreach, I'm wondering whether you're asking us, do we want to rezone our city or not? Or do you just want trees along the street? Because there's two different things there. And so I would ask, urge this council to listen to the public. And I, you, we haven't heard very much chances for public um, feedback. We haven't heard that very much, as much as is pop it should be done, okay? The second thing is um, we do need more housing, and I'm not sure there's a huge need for more hotels. Maybe I'm wrong, but there's a lot of hotels being built. So I, to the, I respond to the man who came in through Zoom. Um, is it illegal to be doing more housing? I mean, do, doing more hotels when we should be doing more housing? Mm -hmm. So even though this project is still in the, already in the works, it doesn't mean it has to be a done deal. What we need is more housing, not hotels. So could the, could the lawyer answer this, whether the, the, the new law that the man on the Zoom requested? Is there somebody here that could answer that question? Let me ask if uh, the planning director would be willing to address that. If you just give him a second at the microphone, thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Thank you. We are well aware of the Housing Accountability Act and take it very seriously, including our obligation to follow it at all times. The, a hotel is a permitted use right now. And so what the uh, caller was referring to is a footnote under the multifamily housing requirements. So right now you can build a hotel there. Under the proposed regulations, you can still build a hotel. So we are consistent with the Housing Accountability Act, and um, this 
um, this change really amounts to whether a hotel can build from 50 feet to 70 feet. Um, and um, this would allow for a hotel to build between that 50 feet and 70 feet. A residential developer could come in onto that site and also propose residential. That is not what has been proposed. Um, but again, that matter is a separate matter. So we are not reducing any capacity because a residential developer could still come in and, um, and develop a residential project there. What we're talking about is whether or not a, uh, a commercial office or a hotel could build between 50 feet and 70 feet. Thank you. That won't be taken out of your time. Feel free I, to- I just want to urge the city council to um, be building, to, um, to be approving housing, affordable housing and general housing rather than hotels. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Person online, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Candace Brown. Hi. Um, the point I want to make is actually, this is supposed to be about updating and streamlining the general plan and minor changes, but here you're making a dramatic change in policy by in entering the idea of visitor serving, and you don't define it. So it's so general in nature that it could include in entertainment venues, it could include additional hotels. Are you still there? Yeah, oh, yes, it can include here. additional hotels, and also it, um, a, a, a wide range. So the fact that it's not defined in itself is problematic. Uh, the existing housing could be turned into Airbnbs because that could be visitor serving. Um, everything along that riverfront could be changed to visitor serving because you've introduced that now into the general plan. And that would have a wide range of um, impacts, especially when it comes to traffic, parking, um, you know, probably many things I haven't even thought of. Um, also, as far as the height, if you allow the height to go from 50 to 70 and then the rooftop on top of that to be initial 15, we're talking 85 feet. Um, I really cannot believe that we're building a hotel across from the metro that we've built 205 luxury condos next to the metro. Uh, we continue to ignore students, which are 30 percent of our population, families, people that want to walk and live downtown that we've talked about for years and make it a walkable community. We're not doing that when we're inviting uh, in introducing this idea of visitor serving. This is a dramatic change and it should be discussed more widely and should not be introduced and put into this particular agenda item today. I think you should take it off the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Carrillo. Hi. I can't, I'm not hearing very well, so I don't know exactly what's been said. <clears throat> but I, I understand that we're all wanting more housing that's affordable for the people who live and work here. And what I see reflected, what it seems like is reflected in the movements that the city is making, is that the value is different than, than what we're speaking. Because when I see the development that's going into the below Laurel Street, um, and it's displacing residents who are mostly probably renters, and it's probably one of the more low-income areas of our city. So we're just placing a lot of people, and we're putting in unaffordable market rate, mostly uh, condos. Where do those people go? I envision them either leaving the area or being on the street. And then when I see that we have, I'm, I'm mostly referring to the hotel, <clears throat> when I see that I, I, what seems to be understood is that if we build on city lots or county lots and we work with um, nonprofit uh, low income housing developers, that's when we can afford to build housing that's really affordable. So when I see that the city is sell selling these two lots that could be affordable housing, maybe even giving priority to the people who are displaced <clears throat> below Laurel, um, and, and we're and I have heard, and I don't know if it's true, that um, in that area, legally, the city is supposed to be offering that those lots for housing development before they make another decision on the sale of those properties. If that's all true, um, it, it, 
the, the actions are not matching the words. And it really, it really disturbs and concerns me. And I've been watching that property for years because I was a credit union member. And we, as credit union members, were supposed to be having some say in what they did, but we didn't find out about the sale till after the sale was through, was not of, of conscience. So I think that's what I want to say. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carrillo. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? Let's take that person now. Good afternoon, person online. Hi, thank you for taking our calls and our comments. I want to support the people that just came before me addressing the inequities of putting a hotel in this prime location. We need to see more efforts from the council and the planning department to seek out developers and nonprofits who will build what we need, affordable and low-income housing. We continue to see council and staff prioritize corporate, pri corporate priorities. And it's very discouraging and very angering to us to see that our voices are, are like being placated. You hear what we're saying but your actions are not living up to what we expect of our servants. Please find a developer that will build affordable housing. It's city land in prime location by the transport system. Thank you. Thank you so much. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? All right, matters back before the council. I'll move, the I will move the staff recommendation. There's a motion on the staff recommendation. Is there a second? I'll second. There's a second. Would you care to open on that? I would. I would just like to say that um, while I appreciate the public engagement, there was a lot of inaccuracies um, that people were saying and just some facts that people were putting out there that just weren't true. And so actually of the, of the um, properties or the units that are gonna be being built in the next five years that we recently got a presentation on, um, of the 2,722, 31% of those are affordable. We recently got back from a conference in San Francisco, or, um, Sacramento and uh, Council Member Bruner and um, Calendari Johnson and Watkins and I talked to council members from all over the state and we were the only city that we talked to that's actually building our own affordable housing. Um, there's people in this room that have laid the foundations to build the mixed use library project, Pack Station South, Pack Station North, and a number of other developments that are going in to address housing affordability in the city. The downtown redevelopment, in my opinion, has been um, essentially deferred maintenance since the earthquake. There's a lot of properties that could have been using a, a redevelopment. And so I really appreciate the work that's gone into all of these projects. I'm excited about the hotel. I'm excited to share our town with people and having a hotel downtown to me just makes sense. So I'm very excited about this project and this what's before us today. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Mr. Newsom. Uh, thank you, Mayor Keeley. Uh, and I support the agenda item as well. The agenda item is about a whole host of issues other than uh, the hotel, uh, and it supports economic development in downtown, and by extension, our small businesses in downtown, and uh, will eventually result in more tax funds and, and provide more jobs. Uh, I would like to add uh, uh, an addition to the motion, though, uh, and this is kind of in response to the concerns we've heard about affordable housing uh, in our community. Um, and I was. I uh, wonder if Ms. Bush could put that up or the amendment, the amendment. Thank you.
Uh, so I support the motion, but I'd uh, like to add uh, the following language or um, insert. Uh, section 2 for additional height zone B, insert new subsection F at the end of page 81, um, and F, affordable housing public benefit fee for non-residential projects. Uh, and it you know, just states an application for additional height is voluntary uh, because an applica applicant requesting additional height is receiving a benefit in the form of increased height and intensity, and to ensure that non-residential projects which are granted additional height reasonably contribute to the city's need for affordable housing. Uh, non-residential projects that are granted additional height shall be required to pay an in lieu public benefit fee in the amount of $5 per square foot of gross floor area occurring above the 50 uh, foot base height limit, i.e. the additional gross floor area occurring within the project on levels uh, that exceed the 50 foot base height limit. And the fees shall be paid prior to occupancy of the project and all fees provided uh, collected under this section shall be deposited uh, into the City of Santa Cruz's uh, Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Uh, there, there is a motion. Is there a second? Excuse me. Is that be? You're accepting that? Let me ask if there is. I moved the stock from the beginning. Yes, that'd be a friendly, amendment. Yes, a friendly amendment. Yeah, of course. Okay, it's accepted. It's agreeable to second. Very good. All right. Uh, so please open on your motion to amend there. No, thank you, sir. Uh, so. Um, you know, we, we've heard a, a good bit of comment and we received a good bit of correspondence about concern about affordable housing in our community. Uh, and as Council Member uh, Golder, uh, our Vice Mayor Golder has uh, pointed out, we are doing a good, we are building a good bit of affordable housing in our community. And I think this, uh, this added language, uh, this addition uh, to this motion, I think will help address uh, these concerns and provide, um, help provide more funds uh, for building affordable housing uh, in our community. Uh, and I... I do want to add, um, you know, this, this amendment is about a whole lot of, a whole host of other issues than the hotel, uh, but I, I do want to add that when uh, the sale of the properties that uh, were discussed comes before us, uh, that I will be pushing for, uh, if the sale was to go through, I'll be pushing for those funds to be placed into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund as well, but that's a whole other conversation of if that will even occur. If I could also be certain, I, the clerk just asked if the notation that was previously on the bottom was part of the friendly amendment and the answer to that question is no. All right, thank you. Sir? Thank you for the opportunity yeah. to comment. Uh, uh, I'd, have, I'd have two comments on uh, this particular item. Um, one is, um, if it pleases the council, I think um, moving it to an alternative location where we are specifically discussing the additional height um, uh, would um, uh, be a, a better location. Um, so basically taking this and uh, shifting it to another location where it's just easier to, to find with the additional height provisions, um, I can um, let you know what that section is. Um, it would be... Um, Hold that. I should have opened that before I got up here. It would be um, subsection B um, and then Roman numeral 6 on page 73. It's under the additional height zone. Or excuse me, that is, that's for additional height zone A. So if you wanted to add this to additional height zone A, we would add it there as well, should the council choose to do so. For additional height zone B, it would be subsection B, Roman numeral 7 on page 79. Let me pause here, make sure that we understand that this is essentially where to place this item. Do you have any objection to that? Okay. Is that clear to you, Ms. Bush, where we're placing this? Uh, yes. Yeah, so so for, for additional height zone B, it would be subsection B, Roman numeral 7, on page 79 of the document. <laughs> VII. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and it is it's in the it's what I sent you. Um, so if um, if it pleases the council for for subsection or excuse me for additional height zone B that would that's where it would be placed. Um, if you care to add it to subsection to excuse me additional height zone A as well, we also have a section um, where it could go for that. We're just going to hold here for a second. The question was whether there was a desire for the council to add this to an other section. Is that correct? 
That's correct. And the effect of that would be? The effect of that would be essentially, so the additional height zone B, um, the east side of Front Street um, between um, Soquel and um, Laurel, um, subsection, or excuse me, uh, additional height zone A is essentially between um, uh, Pacific and Front Streets. It extends farther north as well. So this provision should should a uh, project um, seek to uh, pursue the additional height, um, it would also um, have these provisions. That is, it's it's slightly different in that the base height is not 50 feet. I believe it's 55. 55. Thank you. Let me ask this question, Mr. Butler. Is what you're saying here that if for some kind of policy continuity purposes, that would be the preferred way to go? If you are recommending that an uh, additional height zone B, I would also recommend that it's also included in A. Mr. Newsom, you all right with that? Yes. Sir. Second of the motion, all right with that? Without objection, we will. that will be added. Yes. Ian is a friendly amendment on the motion. Thank you for your assistance on that for the debate or discussion. Let me start with Ms. Watkins and we'll go to Ms. Brown. Ms. Watkins. Uh, yes, thank you for the presentation and work and I am definitely supportive of the um, added direction. I just have a question like if in an example project downtown, how much would that generate? Just that, I mean, if we're, I don't, what do these numbers translate to? So that's going to depend. It, it'll be a project by project basis and depending on um, a number of factors. One, how large the lot is. And then really, most importantly, what the uh, amount of square footage is above the 50-foot um, uh, height limit. But if you had, for example, um, say 50,000 square feet, then you would be around $250,000 for, um, for that um, that trade-off, and that would go straight to our affordable housing trust fund. Great, thank you. And then the other question I had is, um, I know there was comments around the public feedback and the process around um, checkpoints, but what I heard was there's additional opportunities for the public to weigh in. So the removal of superfluous uh, engagement is is not removing the public process, but essentially streamlining it in existing ways that we already move forward with public input. Is that accurately capture what was described? That's correct. The use permit um, would not be required. And um, I think Eric was, was mentioning this, you know, use permits are often for uses that, um, you know, you're potentially going to have some type of impact. And so, you know, noise or uh, fumes, uh, something of that. And, and then if you end up violating that, you can revoke that use permit. Sure. Um, for residential uses, we're not going to revoke the use permit and say you can no longer use these units as residential units. And so having a, it, it's actually something that um, we're working with HCD on as part of our housing element to remove the use permit requirements for residential uses in general. And so as we were updating this, um, it was an opportunity for us to look at those and say, hey, we, we don't need the use permit requirement. There aren't, we're, not, we're not conditioning the residential use as we would um, some other use that, that may have those um, potential uh, impacts on the surrounding community. Okay, great. Thank you for that clarification. It's important for the public. Um, just one other comment suggestion is, I know this comes up a lot, and I know we've had a lot of conversation. I know we've done policy around public engagement and criteria and thresholds, but I also have seen such confusion also ensue beyond that actual you know, action. So I don't know if there's a way for us to really think about how we translate these types of policy scenarios and uses to a lay person trying to track how they can weigh in and win and what types of projects. And I know we have a table, I was looking at it online, um, but I think it's really challenging, you know, for the average person and it's a, it's a con like a continuous issue that arises here. So maybe in terms of um, potential marketing folks or people who are, you know, skilled in that area, an opportunity there. And I'm looking at our city manager because I think that's maybe an opportunity. Appreciate the comment, uh, Councilmember Watkins. And yes, it is a 
inherently complex topic getting more complex by the day uh, as Sacramento signs another 60 housing bills that we're uh, deciphering. Uh, so that's something we'll continue to work on. I do think there's some work we can do to disseminate it uh, for the broader community um, uh, that's, that's more consumable. So I appreciate the comment and we'll work with Erica Smart, our communications manager and our planning team uh, to continue doing what we can uh, to make this work more approachable. Council Member Brown. Thanks. Uh, so I first I'll uh, just okay. want to echo or, or uh, associate myself with the comments of Council Member Watkins. I think that, uh, you know, we get these um, kind of packages of uh, amendments that uh, have a lot in them and can be very confusing, even for those of us who have been immersed in this or semi-immersed for a, a while. Uh, so helping the public understand what these changes mean is really important. I think when we see uh, proposals like the one before us uh, without that, um, and also potentially with it, because uh, once it's clear what we're doing, there will be, you know, responses to that too. Um, but I think that's really important that people need an opportunity to um, understand and weigh in when we're making these kinds of changes. Um, in this case, I feel like, um, you know, yeah, it's it's kind of billed as, as cleanup and uh, minor, and much of it is. There are, you know, there's a lot in here. And... Um, it's some, but you know, the, the level of significance depends on one's perspective as well. And I, and there are some items in here, which I, I believe will result in significant changes. And so, um, to the extent that we are clear about that, um, as we move forward, I think that it will also help the public, um, when we do not, um, engage critically and meaningfully, um, and we make changes that seem to counter the, um, what many community members are telling us, we know that that results in, um, you know, a level of dissatisfaction and pushback that um, is, can be a very uncomfortable. Uh, and so it's incumbent upon us to try to make um, this process a little bit more cooperative. <laughs> and um, so I, in that spirit, I am going to support the motion today. Um, but I want to, um, I want to make a, a couple of comments about that. Um, the, you know, the downtown plan and the last round of amendments that were adopted in 2017, I was on the council, we were both on the council at that time, I didn't support the overall package because of some of the elements in it. Um, and that included the uh, rezoning or, or the, the shift to allow for a hotel at the corner of Laurel and um, Front Street. That is not what is before us today. We are looking at a general um, plan amendments and the local coastal program. However, it does um, bear on that site. And so I think that's why there's been some conflation in the comments that we're receiving today because it will have an impact. Um, and I look forward to having that conversation when the time comes. Um, I, I will say that um, with this change, you know, we've been, we've been told we need density, we need to really focus on housing, we've got a pro-housing designation, that that is the reason to uh, allow more density and height in our downtown and across the city. And this seems to, um, and in fact, some of the language that's being removed, if you look closely at the red line, does take out words like priority for housing in some places. So we are making a change here that will result in less, potentially less housing in the downtown. And I believe that it's critical that we have, um, when there are developers who are gonna benefit from changes that we are making that are, are voluntary on our part as well, um, that they make a contribution to uh, help address our affordable housing crisis. And um, while this is a, a, perhaps a small amount right now, I mean, 250K based on the last costs I've seen for an affordable unit is about half a unit. Right? It's not very much money, but it will give us um, an inroad into 
um, you know, working with <laughs> developers who are not building housing or are going to forego some other housing for other uses to get some benefit from that. So I, I'm, I'm kind of reluctantly supporting it today, um, but I want to be really clear that what we're doing is, um, in some sense, undermining our own uh, priority that we've we've said we have. Um, so, and it's it, it it has potential not just for this one site, but across the downtown. So. Um, I acknowledge it, and I'll uh, I'll go with it for today. And I appreciate uh, Councilmember Newsom's uh, amendment to the staff recommendation or the addition. Thanks, Thank Ms. Brown. Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. Um, I'll also associate myself with Councilmember Watkins' comments and Councilmember Brown's um, in terms of the um, accessibility of the information. I read through the packet, read through the correspondence, and I was definitely left confused. So I connected with um, Lee Butler and um, Matt Huffaker to pull it apart and understand it. But clearly there was some confusion by community members. So um, yes, so more, um, not transparency, but just accessibility of the information in a digestible way. Um, I, I am curious about Councilmember Brown's last comment about undermining our own commitment to affordable housing. I, I, I don't see that clearly, so, um, and we can talk offline, but if you can share that with me, I, I would, or you could share it here. Um, I, I'd like to, to see that because I don't see that clearly. And um, you're right, Vice Mayor Golder, that we heard over and over again that our commitment to building affordable housing in the city, being a contributor to affordable housing, is being recognized across the state. Um, we've gotten the pro-housing designation thanks to the great work of our planning and economics development department. Um, we're one in six, am I getting that right, across, oh, oh, oh we were one, of the, one of the six percent to meet our arena goals, including our very low income, low income. So um, I see our commitment and um, in action. I see it in the units that we're providing in the community. Um, and I think this uh, agenda item is a step towards that. It took me a while to get there to understand it, but I got there and understood, and I hope the public does now too, but it's a step towards that. So I will be supporting this um, recommendation. I appreciate the amendment from Council Member Newsom. Um, I think it listens to and adds what the community, what we've been hearing from the community, so it's responsive to that. Um, so I'm looking forward to supporting this. The vice mayor is recognized. I just wanted to also address that comment because I, I hear what you're saying, but I think I disagree a little bit in that I don't think it diverges from what our goals are in that adding business and hotels where you can get transient occupancy tax contributes to our general fund, which enables us to pay our staff a living wage, right? Like, so it's all connected. And so if we just only build housing, then I see we're not doing our job. And so I do think housing is important, but we have to think about the whole economic web in order to keep our city um, financially sustainable. So that's just my thought on that. Thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. Ms. Brown, you were referenced? Yeah, sure, yeah. I'll, I'll, I will, <laughs> since you asked. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I, and I, I don't disagree, uh, Vice Mayor Golder, um, with your point about what those other uses and other kinds of development will do. Um, I guess what I'm saying is we, are, um, we allow additional height due to density bonus, and the, the um, impetus for that is getting more housing. Um, here we are extending the ability to increase height to non-residential projects, we're not getting more housing out of that. So we are foregoing the potential for housing on those sites. Um, that's, so I do believe that in some sense it, 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 it strays from, maybe it doesn't completely undermine, but it strays from what we say is our um, overarching priority. Um, and again, I recognize that's a matter of perspective. Um, my perspective is that any new development where there will be a benefit um, to the developer, we should be doing everything we can to get affordable housing out of it. And in this case, it's, it would be through fees rather than units. So um, that's just kind of where I, I'm coming from. I don't mean to say that we're like contravening our, you know, our goals, but we are straying a little. Further debate or discussion? Seeing and hearing none. Clerk will call the roll. Council members Newsom? Aye. Brown? 
Aye. Watkins? Aye. Bruner? It's, sorry, this, she's disqualified herself. Um, Calentari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. And Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and it's ordered. What we are going to do is take a very brief recess. I know that those of you who are here on item 26 are <laughs> going, oh my goodness. But if you would just give us five, uh, let's, let's take 10 minutes. We'll come back at 10 after four and we'll hop right on item 26. <laughs> Santa Cruz City Council is back in session following our afternoon, brief afternoon recess. We are on item number 26 on our regular agenda. This is a Metro Downtown Transit Center interim operations plan and approval of plans and specifications and related actions. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Mayor, Council Members. I'm Norm Daly with the Economic Development and Housing Department. I'm here uh, this afternoon to uh, produce or give you a, a, a look at the interim operations plan. I'll provide some context and some background um, with respect to the nexus with Pacific Station North project. And then I'll uh, briefly go through the motion before you any actions associated with it. So the uh, interim operations plan is really under the umbrella of the Pacific Station North project. Relocation of the existing Metro Transit Center is necessary in order for the PAC Station North project to proceed. On the right of the screen, you can see the location of the existing Metro Center. What the interim operations plan does is move the transit center operations over to the left, to the area that's uh, really defined by the Trader Joe's and CVS parking lot, the Galleria, the Wells Fargo Bank. And uh, that's where the temporary operations of Metro will move to when the plan is implemented. So just a brief recap of the PAC Station North project. Uh, it's a rendering of the uh, developer's presentation. So it's a uh, transit-oriented redevelopment project with 128 units of affordable housing. And the project is a collaborative uh, arrangement between the city for the future housing, Eden Housing, and Metro. And all of those players together were able to access the multiple funding sources that we see here on the screen. Um, three of those are directed city uh, sources of funding, and there's also state and federal uh, monies involved, in it, as well as funds from Metro. So PAC Station North uh, provides 128 units of affordable housing, 32 of which are extremely low income units, 63 are very low, and there are 31 Section 8 project-based units, and there are two manager units. And it includes a new Metro Transit Center. So this, this rendering shows the uh, affordable housing project with the ticketing center of Metro on the ground floor. So the interim operation plan itself is a temporary relocation of the existing Metro Center, and it's necessary that it's relocated in order to meet funding requirements associated with the date of the start date for the Pacific Station North project. Demolition of the existing Metro Center is projected for early February 2024. And approval of the interim operations plan today will allow the uh, temporary operations to be put in place on or before February 1st. And once the uh, new transit center is completed, the uh, traffic, the temporary traffic patterns that we're talking about today will be restored to their pre-project conditions. There's a bigger look at the plan that was developed uh, in, in conjunction with the city and Kimberly Horn, our uh, consultant on this. And we'll talk more about this as we get further into the presentation. But basically, the interim operations plan is um, bounded by a Soquel Avenue to the uh, right of the screen, Front Street to the bottom of the screen, River Street off to the left, and then River Street south at the top. Key elements of the plan include a temporary revision to the transit circulation patterns, associated pavement restriping, uh, a clockwise transit circulation around the area that I just described, 
And there's a conversion of River Street South to one way southbound with a contraflow bicycle lane for bike access. And then a Front Street uh, shared bicycle lane to facilitate bus movements, uh, a bus station service, and bicycle movements. And finally, uh, Metro will have a ticket sales and call center at 603-605 Front Street, which is just about across the street from CVS. So before you this afternoon, you have a motion with uh, six different actions. First is to adopt the resolution approving the plans and specs uh, and providing design immunity to the city. Second is to direct staff to review impacts of the plan on parking revenue with the downtown commission. Third action is to direct staff to return to the Transportation and Public Works Commission with a plan update following its implementation. Fourth would be to authorize the city manager to enter into a lease agreement with Metro for the ticket sales call center. Fifth would be to adopt a resolution amending the FY24 budget, allocating Metro funds to the Pacific Station North project for implementation of the plan. And the sixth and final action would be to authorize the manager to enter into an MOU with Metro, the project developer, which would define roles and financing commitments, particularly associated with the implementation of the plan. So I'll just run through each of these actions fairly quickly. Uh, so the first one, adopting the resolution approving the plans and specs. As I mentioned, it provides design immunity for the city and its employees. Uh, Public Works staff has worked with our consultant in uh, developing the plan and approving the elements of the plan. Uh, the city traffic engineer has reviewed and approved the plan as being consistent with the city's standards and applicable state laws. Uh, the traffic engineer will also uh, have the ability to install traffic control devices and post appropriate signs and markings indicating no stopping zones, no parking areas, and restricted parking areas related to the plan. And this resolution author authorizes uh, removal of unlawfully parked vehicles during the plan's implementation. So our recommendation is that you do indeed adopt the resolution to approve the plan, and that would become, uh, the immunity aspect would become effective immediately upon adoption. Second action is to direct staff to review the impacts of the plan on parking revenue with the downtown commission. Uh, in order to install some of the elements of the plan, there's a reduction of on-street parking spaces that's necessary. So it's uh, prudent to review the impacts on the revenue, parking revenue, over the two-year interim operations plan. And uh, we would analyze that and look at any budget impacts and get back to the downtown commission. So our recommendation is that uh, you direct the staff to do just that. Third action is to direct the staff to return to the Transportation and Public Works Commission with the plan update following its implementation. A little background with the uh, TPWC in uh, September, they carried a motion to reject the plan, but it, it also recommended that the council approve the plan with the following changes, <clears throat> which we have uh, incorporated into the plan. So adding a contraflow bike lane on River Street South, um, we've improved the River Street South mid-levy access at the pedestrian bridge over the river. Uh, we have removed on-street parking on Front Street and River Street South for better bicycle and bus car interactions. And we have maintained the accessible parking spaces. Uh, that motion also directed the plan to be returned to the TPWC with, uh, to evaluate operational details once the plan's commenced. It was a second motion from the TPWC <clears throat> which uh, recommended that the council direct the TPWC to review the downtown parking garage rates to determine if uh, the loss of parking spaces during the plan had any large impact. So <clears throat> we will uh, review that data and report back to the downtown commission. Uh, <clears throat> the plan was presented to the downtown commission in late September. No action was taken, but they did request that uh, adequate outreach be performed, security be provided in the plan area, and impacts to the downtown parking district be evaluated. Our recommendation is that you <clears throat> direct staff to return to the TPWC with the plan update. <clears throat> Fourth action was to authorize the manager to enter into a lease agreement for the ticket sales and call center which is gonna be located at 603-605 Front Street in the city-owned Front Street Garage. 
the lease is under negotiation, <clears throat> the tenant improvements will be by Metro, and market rates will apply per city policy. Lease direction is expected to be two years, which is the interim period operation. Uh, there will be an option to extend if the new Metro Center um, needs additional time to, for completion. <clears throat> so we would uh, recommend that you authorize the manager to enter into that lease agreement. Fifth would be to adopt a resolution amending the FY24 budget allocating Metro funds to the Pacific Station North project for the interim operations plan itself. Uh, current cost estimates to design and construct the plan uh, is $500,000. <clears> Additional costs as yet undefined will exceed the 500,000. Metro would fund any additional costs as they are identified. So our recommendation is that you adopt the resolution amending the FY24 budget. The final action is to authorize the manager to enter into an MOU with Metro and the Pack Station North developer defining roles and financing commitments for the interim operations plan itself. <clears throat> uh, for the future housing and Eden housing, the developers of Pack Station North are under an existing previous MOU with the city and Metro to develop the project. For the future housing in Eden, will actually construct the interim operation plan elements as part of the Pacific Station North project. And in order to accomplish that, <clears throat> a secondary memorandum of understanding is required between the parties to define those roles and financial contributions. Our recommendation is that you authorize the manager to enter into that MOU with Metro, the project developer, for uh, de defining the finance commitments and roles for the plan. I wanted to just <clears throat> touch briefly on uh, city review and outreach for this, the interim operations plan. In late August, the uh, fire department uh, reviewed the plan itself and had no comments or concerns. Uh, also in late August, we provided the plan to the downtown association for review. No comments were received at that time. In early September, we previewed the project with the police department traffic specialist. He had no comments or concerns. Later in September, we took the plan to the Transportation and Public Works Commission, who reviewed it, and we received their comments. We've incorporated a number of their comments into the plan. Public Works staff also posted flyers about the plan uh, in advance of the TPWC meeting. <clears throat> in late September, the Downtown Commission reviewed the plan. We received comments from them. And also in late September, uh, we provided the plan to visit Santa Cruz for review. We haven't had comments to date on that. Uh, staff from Economic Development and Housing will continue to do more outreach to downtown businesses adjacent to the plan area and will work directly with the DTA to provide additional outreach opportunities. Metro has uh, <clears throat> provided or will provide additional outreach, um, maps and posters, posted notices at the existing transit station, all affected bus stops, uh, they'll include mention of it in their Headways publication. Uh, they'll use their social media platforms to provide information about it. They will have a plan website. Uh, they will distribute to the city and county email lists uh, information pertaining to the, change, to the changes in the plan. And all that material will be available in English and Spanish per their uh, limited English proficiency policy. Excuse me. They also have more outreach efforts planned this fall as part of their reimagined Metro and the Rapid Corridors project, which will inform the public of upcoming changes to downtown operations as a whole. So, again, we're back here to this uh, the major outlook for the project. I'm going to turn it over to or back to the council first. We have Matt Starkey from Public Works here to respond to questions, and we also have um, <clears throat> members uh, from Metro their executive branch and some frontline staff here as well to respond to any questions. Thank you very much. Very much appreciate that. Uh, let me ask, we will move around the dais here. Let me ask if there are questions, Ms. Kalantari Johnson. Thank you. Thank you so much for the presentation. And I just want to acknowledge and thank the team, um, council before us, uh, Metro staff. I know a lot of work has gotten into getting us to this place and bringing us a new metro center and 128 um, affordable housing units back to the last conversation we're having. So 
This is really wonderful. Um, I wonder if you could speak to um, the implementation timeline uh, of getting us to the groundbreaking for the transit center. Yeah, the funding, uh, the funding mix for the project requires that um, the existing Metro Center um, be vacant by February 1st. So our intention with the plan is to have the interim operations area up and running no later than February 1st, preferably a few days earlier. That's, it. That's the questions I have for now. Thank you. Thank you. My goodness. All right. Well, there we go. Let me ask if uh, anyone who's with us today in chambers would like to make comments on this item. And let me, while you're coming forward, let me ask Ms. Bush if we have anyone online. Mm, yes. One we person do. just raised Okay. Up. Good afternoon again, sir. <laughs> yes. Good afternoon. My name is still James Ewing, and the clerks forget that. I wasn't going to speak on this. I mean, I made copies of it and stuff, and I read through it. And in my idle time, I saw on the second page, if, a, if approved by city council on this October 24th and at the end, anticipated to require a two-year construction period, traffic patterns will be restored to pre-project conditions. So it's like, hey, that's one area where the cost of progress and I did stay here a couple additional hours to endure um, commentary like you guys are little pieces of string on a kite being moved around and stuff by a really focused agenda. And uh, I suppose I'm a glutton for punishment to keep witnessing this. Um, provided you guys with a copy of our Declaration of Independence and how powerful individuals can actually be. I mean, I could have provided you with another excellent article about city managers, but I only have a couple copies. So I guess I'm just here as a witness, and, you know, I didn't want to put my foot in my mouth any more than I normally do, because um, when I realized that that stuff was temporary, at least something being rubber stamped here is temporary. There's a lot of things that are going through here that I think are really challenging for the present and the future. So that's enough. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Well, I also wish that, you know, I hear all this bounce back, you know, and some other people can, you know, it seems like citizens will say stuff, and then there's all these other comments that come in, and I don't really get in rage about anything. I have compassion for situations, but... Uh, it really, I don't mean for this to be an insult or anything, but I have compassion for all of you because you guys are really being controlled by the city manager. And he wasn't elected by the citizens that voted for you. And I think that that's actually a really important distinction to make. So thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Let's go to the person online, and then we'll hear the gentleman from SMART. Good afternoon, person online. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Welcome. My name is Ron Goodman. I'm the current chair of the Transportation and Public Works Commission. Um, I just wanted to say we got some great community feedback about this plan, um, and the commissioners had great suggestions. We had some problems with the plan as it was, which is why we rejected the plan initially. Um, but with the incorporation of the new suggestions into the plan, um, I can't obviously speak for the entire commission, but I'm personally very supportive of the plan. I think it really shows our city's commitment to alternative transportation, um, and it very much prioritizes bike, pedestrian, and transit. So I want to say thank you to staff, and I encourage you to support this. Well, thank you for your service on the commission and for your input to the city council on this item. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Brandon Freeman. I'm the general chairperson of Smart Local 0023, representing all bus operators, some dispatch schedulers and supervisors for Santa Cruz Metro, Fixture, and Paracruz. Um, first off, I want to thank you guys for listening here, and I really want to extend some appreciation to the city staff who has received this from us and helped us get through this. Um, we've been working on this for multiple, multiple months. Um, 
I want to assure everyone here that we looked at multiple options and this area was no one's first choice, but there was no real first choice. It's something that we have to get through. It's not something we want to get through, but we kind of need to focus at the goal at the end, end here, right? We're talking about building a world-class transit system and we're talking about matching that with the housing, the hydrogen projects and all of the other things that we're doing. This is a major step in getting that done. The number one thing that I always hear about this plan is why do you need so much space? I'm going to answer that. The reason why we need so much space is because currently in our transit center, we're kind of cordoned off from the rest of the public, right? We're inside of our own space. This allows us to control it and keep it safe. When we're talking about going to a more public area where there's a lot more pedestrian traffic, there's a lot more bicycle traffic, we need that space to ensure that we can see properly when we're pulling in and out of buses to make sure that we can make transfers appropriately without you having to walk across the different parking lots and things that there are. With this plan, whatever bus you're on, we'll be able to drop you next to the bus that you need to get on. So that's why we need so much space. It's for the ease of access, and the most important thing is the safety of the public as we operate in this area. It will take away some parking. I know that that might be difficult for some of the businesses there. I'll remind you that the average sedan may bring you four people. I'll bring you 40, and I'll do this every 15 minutes. So we'll be increasing the foot traffic for these businesses, and I hope that that leads to an increase in their business. Because ultimately, this is a step in making our entire community better. And that's only done when we all work together. So thank you for your time. Obviously, I support this plan. Thank you very much, sir. Anyone else online, Ms. Bush? We'll take the next person online. Good afternoon. Hi. Hi. Good evening. Good evening. Um, yes, my name is Ken Brown again. And I'm also on the Transportation Commission. I also wanted to um, validate what Ron had to say. There was a lot of deliberation, um, and we were quite concerned about safety and parking and the effect on the businesses. So we did try to come up with solutions to uh, affect that. But one of the compromises that we had to make was on the parking. So I just wanted to point out that, um, and it was brought up by Sue Gilchrist, who was also on the commission, that um, she felt that the parking would be a big impact uh, because the on-street parking is a lot less expensive than the uh, garages. And that's why we were suggesting that there might be some way to affect the rates during this period so that people, because of equity and accessibility issues, could have the opportunity to come downtown and not be affected by the parking rates if that was an issue for them. So I just want to point that out. I also am very glad to see that many of the changes that we had suggested were made because there was tremendous concern about the intermingling of bikes and buses in the same common lane, and they widen that, and also the contra flow, and there was also some crossing issues with the pedestrians, which were also fixed. So, again, really great work. I know that there was a little bit of pain from the staff when we made some of these recommendations, but I really appreciate that they took them in fully, and I thank you again for all the work that you all of you have done. Thank you. Bye-bye. Oh, and congratulations on 128 affordable housing units. Fantastic job. Thank you, and thank, thank you. you for your service on the commission. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Daniel Zaragoza. I am the operations manager for Santa Cruz Metro. And I just want to say thank you for considering this item. Um, the, the temporary transfer center and um, the roundabout will be very important in the way that we um, move people here in the county. It, it'll help us move our buses. Um, it'll help us move people. And I just wanted to say it's a very lo important location for us. And I'd like to um, say I appreciate everybody that worked on this project. Um, they made it safe for our operations and safe and convenient for our ridership. So um, I, I just want to repeat that I'm very grateful to everybody that worked on this project. And I look very forward to seeing new housing here in the county. I look forward to seeing a new transit center, a modern transit center, where we can implement our service changes. We want to make our service more reliable, faster, and um, more frequent for the public. So I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you for your very kind words and your comments today. Anyone else online? No, 
former mayor and council member. Good afternoon. <laughs> and now, downtown commissioner. <laughs> Here to speak, uh, supporting the item ahead of you, is just a huge, huge, huge step for our downtown. Um, it didn't just start a few years ago. It started a whole lot of years ago, and it represents so much work by so many people for so long. Um, I uh, have attached uh, in my comments going around uh, the list of the members of our commission. The downtown commission is a great commission. It is experienced. It is committed. It is diverse and they have brought great conversation to this topic particularly. So this item, the interim plan for Metro, um, was um, brought to our commission, as was mentioned, uh, on September 28th. It was not agendized for action, it was just for inf information, but we had a very detailed discussion. Staff was very helpful. Um, this is obviously complicated. It will be, be very confusing. A lot of people have had to make some compromises in coming to this point, but let's all remember, as others have said, this is a means to an end. <laughs> it's gonna be a bit grisly, it's a means to an end. <laughs> and it's so consistent and fulfills so many of the plans that the city's been working on for so long. Our downtown plans, our housing blueprint, our economic development, and this is really key to all of them. Um, uh, as I mentioned, this was brought to the downtown commission. Um, Although we were not able to take official action, we had a, a thorough discussion and agreed on all of these points that I just want to present briefly to you. Uh, and um, please keep them in mind. <laughs> the first was the need for really robust communication. This is going to be so confusing, distressing. It's going to make people, you know, angry, et cetera. Um, all the changes. But... Um, we have so many partners, Metro, City, UCSC, key player, half the riders are from, from UCSC. So ongoing communication about what's happening and why it's happening. Um, the second big concern is for loss of parking. Um, Transportation Public Works acknowledge that. It's really real for our downtown businesses. And people may say, well, there's still spaces in the um, parking lots now. But you know, as well as we know, the surface lots are going away. Mm -hmm. The uh, for many of them for good reason. They're being used as a public resources to build affordable housing, <laughs> um, and that affordable housing, hundreds of units, is going to come online in the next couple of years with, as you know, no parking, and it's already starting to drive people crazy. That idea. So um, that concern for loss of parking affects the businesses the downtown workers, the visitors, and the residents. And I, I don't have much more. You're, you're just fine. You're just fine. <laughs> um, a real concern for public safety around this move. It's no secret that the Front Street and Riverwalk area has had a pattern of some pretty uh, unsavory activity, I'll put it gently. Um, and this is simply not tolerable for the relocated Metro Center. And so here again, I think it's, it's all hands on deck to make this a Metro Center that is safe in both appearance and reality and appealing to all its users. Um, that is not going to be easy, but I wanna put that on the table. And this is a concern that was also expressed by the Downtown Association. I know that um, uh, the Metro, um, Ed went and spoke to the DTA Social and Legislative Affairs Committee quite recently. Um, what I heard in speaking to their representative was it was a much better attended meeting than most and very enthusiastically received. So they're very enthusiastic about the changes that Metro is pursuing, but the safety issue is very real for them. So uh, I support the action, I, <laughs> and representing the whole downtown commission. Uh, I'd like to suggest one change in the actions. If you look at number two on your suggested actions um, for the motion, it says direct staff to review the potential impacts of the plan on parking revenue with the downtown commission. Our interest is really more than just the revenue. It's how does it function. So um, I hope, and it's, I have this in my comment here, I hope you can change that to direct the staff to review the potential impacts of the plan on parking revenue and supply 
with the Downtown Commission and also provide regular updates on the overall functioning of the plan to the Downtown Commission, Downtown Association, and Downtown Management Corporation. There are a lot of stakeholders in this. They want it to succeed, and I think for all of us, <laughs> so much work has gone into this. Um, uh, eyes on the prize. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Matthews. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, my name is Zenon Oliate Crow. I'm a commissioner with the Transportation Public Works Commission, and I did want to talk today a little bit about um, part of our decision, also some personal thoughts. Um, we took a very unprecedented step in rejecting uh, the recommendation. I, we haven't taken uh, that step in, as far as I'm aware, in very recent memory of the Transportation Public Works Commission, and that's because we had a lot of concerns, but we see a lot of those concerns were really addressed, and so we, we really appreciate the, the dedication that went into especially the ContraFlow bike lane on the River Street extension and also the widening of the bus lane on Front Street so that there's more space for cyclists to get around vehicles or for buses that will be using that uh, lane. And there's a real couple of things, though, that are really important to be brought up because in that we are looking at uh, anywhere between, I think if I remember from the presentation, it was 25 to 32 buses per hour using this lane, which is an insane amount of people. We are talking about thousands of people per hour using this facilities. And so when we're talking about the additional, uh, when more part of the recommendation for Transportation Public Works Commission was the reevaluation of the 11 parking spots that are on Front Street on the south side. Um, and we know that those were preserved for the plan, but I do really want to reiterate the point that was made earlier by uh, our friends at SMART that it we are when we are thinking about the capacity and how many folks are using bus lanes versus how many people are using parking spots, there's no comparison. It's really, we are talking about thousands of people versus maybe 30 people using those 11 parking spots in the course of an hour. Um, and so when we think about the priorities of cyclists using the exact same lane as 32 buses per hour, that is a really undue burden. I don't know about you guys, but when I bike and I get passed by a bus, it's scary. Like, they're massive. And ha not having the protected infrastructure to separate that bike infrastructure from that bus infrastructure, especially when we're talking about 32 of them per hour on what perhaps is one of the most, most traffic north-south routes for anybody going anywhere north of downtown, anywhere south of downtown on a bike. That was part of the concerns that we brought up. And so really, I do want to talk about the parking because we do have the front and river uh, Sakail garage that is frequently empty. And we did make the recommendation as CPWC to look at adjusting those rates to make sure they were in line with the rates of the parking that was being lost. But again, prioritizing parking when we have 69% of our carbon emissions coming from transportation is insane planning to me. And it's also insane planning to me that we're prioritizing parking when we know that we are looking at how we're expanding the downtown, we're looking at how we're changing the movement and flow of people, and we know that we're going to be, uh, you know, if things move forwards, having a large expansion plan south of Laurel. And that's going to result in a huge amount of influx of folks into south of downtown that are going to need to be using Front Street as the main transit priority corridor of Santa Cruz. And so I really want to implore everybody here to recognize that in terms of making these decisions about infrastructure and making the decision two years from now when we decide whether to get rid of these buck planes or whether to keep them and expand upon these facilities in a more permanent way, that we consider that this is the direction that we need to be moving in and prioritizing parking over people isn't necessarily the right way. Thank you. Well, thank you. And while you're still here, uh, thank you for your work on the commission. And also thank you for generally bringing a student voice oftentimes to our public policy discussions. Thank you for that. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Johnson, good afternoon. Speaking of someone who needs to be thanked regularly for your good work, good afternoon. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mayor and Council mem women and men for allowing me to be here this evening, this afternoon. Is it afternoon or is it evening? <laughs> it's been here a minute. Thank you so much for the great presentation that you gave. Um, you know, I stand here before the council and, and the mayor and, ask, and invite you to approve the recommendations that was presented before you. And as we all know, this project is so, so critical. And the fact that the move is temporary and it's not going to be permanent, I think we could be able to adjust to some of the shifts and changes that will take place. 
And so I ask you to seriously consider um, approving this project. Thank you. Thank you. You know, I said it rather lightly when you approached the dais, but I do want to thank you for your work at the housing, Santa Cruz County, all the work that you do on affordable housing. Thank you very much for that. You're, You're so very welcome. You're a great leader on that. Let me ask if there's anyone else with us this afternoon who would like, or this evening, who would like to make comment on this item. Seeing and hearing none, the matter is back before the council. I'd be glad to recognize a council member for a motion. Ms. Gontar Johnson is recognized. Thank you. Um, I would like to move staff recommendation with some changes. So maybe it's best if I read it all. Does that work? Okay. Uh, adopt a resolution approving plans and specifications for the Metro Downtown Transit Interim Operations Plan pursuant to Government Code Section 830.6, design immunity, and authorizing removal of unlawfully parked vehicles when the plan is implemented. I think this could go as 1A. Um, schedule implementation of the plan such that it will minimize impact on residents and businesses during the upcoming peak holiday season. Item two, direct staff to review, it says um, Ms. Matthews um, shared with us, so I'm gonna read her proposal because um, I'm in alignment with that direction. Direct staff to, do you have it? I'll read it. Direct staff to review the potential impacts of the plan on parking revenue and supply with a downtown commission and also provide regular updates on the overall functioning of the plan to the Downtown Commission, Downtown Association, and Downtown Management Corporation. I did email it to you, Bonnie. I don't know if you got it. Is this different? No, it's the same. Oh, no, I got yeah. it. Oh, you have it. Okay. Um, okay, I'll read. Would you like me to read, read the rest of it? Um, number three, four, five, and six are as staff have recommended with no changes. Very good. Okay. And then I have, a, um, a, I think, a number seven direct staff to explore and implement increased safety measures along River Street and the adjacent River Levee. There's a motion, is there a second? I'll There's second. a second by Council Member Watkins. Uh, Ms. Kalantari Johnson, you may open on your motion. Great, thank you. Um, you know, as Daniel said, this is all in, in the bigger vision of creating a modern and responsive transit center. Um, I don't know if you guys have all been looking at the news, our local news, but our metro has been getting a lot of attention um, in our community, statewide, nationally, and um, and it's been showing in the form of investments. We got a $38.5 million grant and um, another $14 million grant. I'm looking at Michael. I don't have all the numbers off the top of my head, but um, this is because nationally we're being recognized for the bigger picture. And I've been saying this over and over again, Metro is beyond moving people from point A to point B. And that's, that's uh, apparent in this project. It's about deep partnerships with cities like ours. Um, it's about affordable housing. It's about accessible, equitable, transit um, it's really about community well-being so i am really excited for our city to be uh, a part of this bigger vision that metro has embarked on a key partner in this bigger vision um, and i just want to be mindful that there will be growing pains transitions are hard it'll be hard for all of us metro here at the city um, thank you to the bus drivers it'll be a change for all of you um, it'll be a change to our businesses. It'll be a change for our community members who go shop downtown. So let's be patient with each other as we transition. Um, and let's get excited. Let's be patient, but let's get excited about what this is really contributing to. This is bigger than moving the transit center. It's much bigger than that. So I'm excited. <laughs> so noted. <laughs> Council Member Watkins. Uh, Thank you for your excitement and also for your work as our Metro Chair and uh, Representative. I know that you've spent a lot of time. I too want to thank everybody who's here and also those who've just been part of this process. As a former mayor and council member Matthews said, it, this is really a big, this is a big deal and this has been a long time coming and it has required a lot of input and compromise and it's so wonderful to see it um, before us today in this way. I absolutely agree with some of the amendments. I think that's really important. 
really want to be mindful of our um, downtown businesses and um, making sure that this isn't going to really impede on their ability to have um, just robust sales during the holiday season. I know that's that's something that in the past has um, was an oversight, and we definitely don't want uh, to repeat that. So I really appreciate you bringing that addition. I just have one question. What was brought to my attention, and it's completely anecdotal, was that uh, sometimes UCSD students will buy parking passes to our downtown parking garages um, as a way to get around the uh, restrictions on the campus. And so I don't, I only heard that, I don't know, but I do want to um, see if there's a way to verify that or understand that because this as brought up was we're losing parking for our residents, we're losing parking for our um, visitors, we're encouraging uh, having our sustainable um, uh, public transit, but we also want to be mindful of potential workarounds if that's something that might be uh, happening. So I just, that was brought to my attention. I don't have any evidence to back it up, but wanted to bring it up just as a potential thing to look into. And then on a positive note, I just want to also echo what Councilmember Kalantari Johnson brought forward. This is truly also what health and all policies looks like in action. Mm -hmm. This is affordable housing. This is walkable communities. This is sustainable design that's what this is and that is that connection to the broader initiative that this council and community has also taken to ensure that we're mm -hmm. thinking of those things when we're making these types of decisions so I just wanted to highlight that as well thank you uh, this matter is before us and typically we would not go out are you asking a question for clarification purposes that you would like an answer to I don't necessarily need to an answer I'm just bringing that up as okay. something for us to think about as okay. was brought to my attention uh, thank you council member let me recognize council member Newsom for comments uh, thank you Mayor Keeley uh, I just want to associate myself with uh, my colleagues excitement for this plan uh, this is uh, I think will be really great for my district and for downtown. Uh, and I just want to thank everyone who's worked on this plan uh, uh, through the years and also thank uh, my colleague, Council Member Kalantari Johnson, for her work as chair of the Santa Cruz Metro and all the work that she's done on this, uh, on this, um, on this plan. Uh, and I'm just really excited for it. 120 units of affordable housing and especially 32 units of extremely low housing and, you know, a brand new modern uh, metro center. I think that would be great additions to our, to our community. So thank you. Council Member Brown. Thank you. Um, well, I, I'll send a, a blanket thank you to all of the people who have been involved in this project from its uh, inception decades ago to the current moment. There are so many people I can see here in the room and others who have been so actively involved and committed to this. Um, but I want to uh, share, as I say, just ha give a special shout out to Mr. Freeman. Thank you for being here um, and describing from from your perspective, your your expertise <laughs> from that through that lens, uh, what this op temporary operations plan will do um, to make to to address the public safety issues that have been raised here. Um, you know, I just really appreciate hearing from you. It it made it more clear to me how um, the the challenging uh, period that is ahead of us is, is going to work and that it is going to work, right? And I also want to thank Mr. Tree, your um, your leadership at the Metro, I think, has really um, uh, given us a, like a lot of, of energy, of, of impetus to move forward and support um, in the form of, of resor resources from the state and elsewhere, um, the grants. And, and I just want to appreciate your work to get this moving. When one of the first uh, conversations I had when I first was elected to city council with our then city manager was about this project mm -hmm. and all of the concerns that were up around, uh, you know, kind of interjurisdictional challenges, uh, funding challenges, et cetera. And it, it felt very shaky. And so uh, to see this happening now, just, just a few years later, <laughs> it's been a while, but not that long, uh, is, is really, really heartening. So I, I want to thank you as well. I um, couldn't let the opportunity pass. It looks like maybe uh, once and always, Council Member Matthews is no longer here. Um, but, oh, she is there. There you are. Uh, I want to commend you. You, I mean, you've really been committed to this and, and seeing it through in this way. Um, it's great to, for you to be here. And your, um, 
your ability, your enduring ability to craft motions is noted. <laughs> Thank you for the addition. <laughs> um, and again, just really thrilled to, to see this happen and um, look forward to this project. Thanks. For the questions, comments? Seeing here none, I would, uh, the only addition I would make is to recognize Ms. Baus, who is the Director of Real Estate Development for uh, Eden Housing, and, and thank you and your organization. Uh, we literally, not figuratively, literally could not do these things without you. Please pass that on to your staff, our, our thanks and appreciation. Seeing and hearing no further debate, the clerk will call the roll. Councilmember Newsom? Aye. Brown? Aye. Watkins? Aye. Um, Bruner is disqualified. Kalantari Johnson? Aye. Vice Mayor Golder? Aye. Mayor Keeley? Aye. Motion passes and so ordered. Ms. City Attorney, for the business. Madam City Clerk, for the business. A motion to adjourn will be in order. The Vice Mayor moves <laughs> reluctantly, and uh, Mr. Newsom seconds not reluctantly to, to adjourn. It's not debatable. Those in favor signify by saying I oppose. Motion carries and so ordered. We stand adjourned. Uh, you guys missed me this morning. You guys are like, yeah, mostly like crazy. <laughs> um,